now. Yeah. I would, I'm, I'm wondering how the uh, Missoula um, move is going. I think Anor is trying to join us. Oh, she's in. You're there. Okay. Muted. Oh, there she is. So the um, process is going slow. We have all the books moved, but to move everything else, um, things aren't finished quite yet, so we can't finish moving. Mm. So it's all right. We're Good. still doing curb service from the old building with all the materials in the new building. So staff are getting their exercise <laughs> running back and forth. And they seem to be enjoying it. They like the new building, so they like going over there. Nice. Lots of light and spacious. And so it's much different than the gloomy, crowded library. So. It's good. Good. Well, perhaps we should all rely on a candle, huh? That's right. <laughs> uh, That's right. Well, Life is good. Life is good. Good for you, Hanor. <clears throat> Bruce, if you want to go ahead and get started, it looks like I have 904. Okay. Well, I'm happy to. And hey, uh, folks, this is, you know, unmute and, and ask questions and offer offer observations and add add things that I, I, I miss out. I, I, I Tracy said that she's bad with dates. Well, she's an amateur. I am really bad with dates. And I was looking stuff up yesterday to try to get some sort of the a picture of this. And I realized that my view of the, the Network Advisory Council is really formed from sort of the early days and the days when it sort of spawned the Montana Library Network, which most of you know I was involved with. And um, uh, you know, I, I re when I went to library school back in the in the late 19th century, um, I loathed interlibrary loan. But but I've been really I've really been involved with interlibrary loan as a librarian for for my my entire career, and I've I've actually come to learn it to love it. And the reason why is I think is that interlibrary loan is one way that we sort of demonstrate our 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 our, our cooperative sense, really the best some of the best of, our, of ourselves as librarians and as uh, uh, neighbors here in the state. And, uh, you know, so ILL to me kind of is linked to cooperation. And really for me, the most important product of the, of the, the networking task force and then the network advisory council, which, which came afterwards, uh, was basically the same, the same group, uh, was trust. When I was involved with OCLC, I think the thing that the, the, the biggest advantage Montana libraries had over most, most libraries around the world, quite literally, was there a really high level of trust amongst, amongst libraries and librarians. And, and the way we got that is that we, 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 over time, slowly learned to trust each other and acted out our, our trust. And, and the, the networking task force and the NAC uh, was, was the forum where, where we did that. Backing up a couple steps in the Pacific Northwest, um, well, in, in North America, back in the, um, the 70s, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had OCLC, and, in, and there were a few Montana libraries that were members of OCLC. Um, I think that both the big universities were, uh, the law library here in town was, Carroll College was, and I think that the Ge Geological Survey Library in Billings was, and I think that was, that was the list. And then there was this, this crazy thing called PNBC and libraries would, when they were cataloging, generating cards, you remember cards, uh, would send a copy, they would make two copies of their MasterCard and they would send one copy to the Suzella Library at the University of Washington and they would give a copy of that card to PNBC, which, taken, which, which took and put it in this huge array of um, uh, catalog card uh, forms. And then Montana Library, uh, Honor, uh, would have a patron who was looking for a book. She didn't have it, so she would send an ALA paper request with um, off to PNBC. A student, such as myself, at, at the University of Washington would go to the PNBC ca catalog, find three locations, um, write those locations down, mail it back to Honor, and then Honor would take and, and send that off. So. Uh, we were doing resource sharing, but it was uh, it was clumsy and it was uh, incredibly expensive, both in terms of uh, labor and in terms of time. 
PNBC basically melded into uh, the Washington Library Network, which was built, uh, Tracy and I were talking, using um, uh, some software that Boeing uh, uh, dreamed up. And for a while, it was just it was just the state of Washington that was part of WLN, because it was Washington Library Network. But um, uh, eventually, uh, WLN became uh, the Western Library Network in the 80s, and, and Montana libraries joined that. So sort of mimicking the, 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 the model with uh, OCLC, if a library was a member of WLN, uh, what it would have is a kind of a dedicated terminal, this thing that I think was powered by, by tubes and, and gravitometers and stuff, and put out huge amounts of heat, and basically was um, uh, more or less wired to this computer back in, 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 in the Seattle area and uh, look up and find out who had what book. There was a, there was a process that we called the, the uh, round robin system where uh, back in the early 80s where universities and a few big libraries, I think Parmley Billings was, when it was Parmley Billings, um, was, was part of that, but mostly it was academics, would, would make up a list on teletype of the books that they were looking for and send that teletype string to uh, the next library sort of in, in the string. That library in, in the string would then, if they had that book, they would take and cut cut the cardboard tape. I don't know if you remember how teletype worked, but there was this sort of ticker tape. Splice it back together again and send it on to the next place and then send the book to the to the requesting library. At some point, uh, the, the teletype was replaced by uh, Apple IIs using some primitive uh, uh, communication software. And um, that got slightly, slightly more efficient. But then at some point, uh, uh, more libraries get access to the online version of WLN. And then, ta-da, we got this wonderful thing called, well, and then WLN produced Moncat. And Moncat, I hope none of you still have a copy of this, but Moncat put out kind of a, a thick sheaf of microfiche. And that microfiche basically had, had the, the, the titles of everything in the date in the database plus locations or was it just montana locations it was probably just montana locations tracy do you remember or honor it was just montana locations yeah just that's montana. what i thought yeah and then then the really big thing that happened was they came up with the cd product called lasercat which was the entire database i think wasn't it i think it was yeah it was. And, and it was just one disk. And so this, and this is, this is really where the networking task force comes, comes into play. We had some library uh, service and construction act funds, uh, which is what it was called, I think in those days. And uh, the state library did. And we decided, decided that this was such a good deal for resource sharing that we would start spending for us lots of money in distributing um, uh, laser cat libraries at that time didn't have computers. And so part of the deal was every library got a, I don't, can't remember how big it was, maybe a 512 uh, PC, Microsoft PC, uh, uh, with a, a big monitor in a single serial drive uh, CD player. And then you could, at that point, without being connected to anything, you could look up uh, who had what in the Pacific Northwest. And then um, LaserCat was updated uh, as, uh, you know, as things went along. As WLAN grew, uh, got more and more disks, and, and we were talking earlier that it got more complicated because we were adding we were adding more CD players, and, and it made it made it touchier. The thing about that that was that sticks in my mind as being really really important was um, networking task force was was kind of given the job of, of um, awarding grants for these for these laser cat setups, which was the PC, the I think a dot matrix printer, and the, monitor in, in the, the CD drive. And there obviously wasn't enough money to, 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 to buy one of these setups for everyone in the state of Montana. Um, the, the cool thing was um, that early on, we decided that that was a deal. And I remember Al Randall just looking at, I can't remember if it was in the networking task force or if it was in the commission, because he was a commissioner at that point, Al Randall from, uh, from Libby. He, he said, you know, here's the deal. We're just going to keep out giving, we're going to keep giving out laser cats until everyone who wants one in the state has one. And I think that that is one of the most important things that was ever said 
in the kind of the library sphere in, in Montana because that set that set the that set the expectations that that we were all in this together, you know, uh, as as uh, George Needham from OCLC said, you, you can't you, you can't yell from the back of the canoe, the back of the canoe that your end of the canoe is sinking. Uh, you know, we all we were all in this together, and we basically made a commitment to to hand that stuff out. A lot of the sort of the ethos of 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 all for one, one for all, making decisions in a, in a consensus fashion, et cetera, uh, was really spawned out of that distribution of, of um, uh, laser cat setups. That spawned offline in many ways. It used to be offline was a, a place where we would learn about doing online searches with dialogue and BRS, uh, SDC, some of these online search tools, the equivalent, the equivalent of um, uh, EBSCO and, and, and that kind of thing. But uh, it transformed and we all had these PCs. Well, you know, they would not only work with LaserCAP, but you could also do word processing. You also had spreadsheets. You could even run databases. And if you were foolish like me, you could lose an entire database because it wasn't backed up properly. So kind of looking at this again from time, we, we moved from PNBC. There were a few OCLC libraries. Washington Library Network sort of grew into WLN included Montana. Uh, we went from teletype to Apple IIs uh, to PCs in, in, in 81, Moncat in 85, LaserCat in 87. And then uh, uh, there was this little thing called Mosaic, uh, which came out in uh, 1993 that kind of blew the socks off of everything. And during this time, the, the, the NAC uh, it, networking task force at some point turned into the to the NAC. I don't know what date that was. Uh, Jenny Tracy. It's not not really important. Um, I think it was like about two thousand six or seven. So for a lot for for in the late nineties, um, we you know we we decided that we would. It used to be that the state library would get LSTA LSCA then LSTA Library and Service Technology Act as opposed to Construction Act funds and would, would basically have the sort of open grant process and then distribute money to um, the, the winning, the winning uh, libraries. And, you know, the, as someone who won a lot of those grants, um, you know, I, I think that there was some value in them, but, but I have to say it tended not to be lasting statewide value. Uh, and it was kind of those libraries that were good at writing grants, got grants and everyone else was kind of left out. And, and the, the commission and the, the networking task force decided that we would be better served, we, Montana, um, kind of aligned with this sort of this one, we're all in this together, uh, would be better served with sort of a statewide sort of strategy. And in 1999, we, uh, the NAC and the, and the commission decided that we would have this thing called the Montana Library Network. And that's where we started to go around and ask the library, we, the state library, and I was involved in that. We would go around and ask libraries what they wanted and then figure out you know what we could do and use all use all of the lsta and and some other funds um, uh, uh, to try to benefit as many libraries as we could in the state of montana the mln lasted from 99 through 2006. from that came uh, let's see the shared catalog the montana memory project um, Really, the, the Montana Library to Go sort of came out of that. A courier project. Um, help me. What am I forgetting? Some some shared reference. Some shared reference stuff. Uh, a number of different projects. Um, the and, databases. The da that's databases. right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, magazine databases. And and all of this stuff kind of was being driven by. Uh, the, the, the networking task force. And in a way, the networking task force was kind of the equivalent of a library board for the Montana Library Network. And as such, the uh, networking task force had a great deal of power because they kind of set the agenda and then the commission uh, would kind of take a look at that and, and see if it made sense policy-wise and either thumbs up or thumbs down. And I have to, I'm, I'm delighted to say that the commission was really supportive of, of those whole projects. If you were to take a look at sort of, if you were a political scientist and you were writing abstractly about who had the power in those days in, in, in Montana libraries, it was probably 
the networking task force. They, they really had, they set the direction. They really um, um, assigned where the money, made decisions about where the money went. It's not like the commission was a rubber stamp, but the networking task force, the members were so engaged and they were so knowledgeable about what they wanted uh, and needed in their libraries. And so attuned to the fact that we were all in this together and, and needs varied, but, but we we're gonna make it work for everyone that the, the, the power just gravitated toward to the networking task force. And um, I have to say candidly that, that um, as your new, um, uh, once again, I'm the chair of the, the State Library Commission, I wish that that was the way it was now. Uh, we had such good input from, from the NAC. Um, they, they, they basically steered us so right, it just left the commission sort of um, figuring out how we're gonna make all these great ideas happen or which of the great ideas could happen given, given the resources that were available. And um, uh, there was a feeling of kind of happy mutual dependency amongst Montana libraries at that point. Uh, you know, I, I, I retired from the State Library in 2006 and uh, went off to um, spend a lot of time traveling to uh, uh, Dublin, Ohio. I was on the OCLC board and uh, I kind of lost track of some of the minutia of what was happening with the State Library until I rejoined it, um, what, about five years ago, um, back on the board. So there, there is kind of a, a, a place and time that I'm missing. What, what I have noticed when I came back was the, the, the NAC was not, was not as tight as it used to be. I'm speaking, I'm speaking frankly, um, obviously. Um, and, and I have regretted that and, and, and wished that it would become um, uh, once again a, a really, really strong force in um, helping what I think is the best state library in the, in the union uh, make decisions about, about how to allocate um, uh, scarce resources wisely so that uh, we can realize that goal of having every Montanan have a fair shot at getting what they need from their library. I don't know what else to say. Tracy, Jenny, help me out. I guess a couple of things that I would add, um, just to add on to your, your points, Bruce, um, the network, networking task force and network advisory council have been absolutely fundamental to some really key processes where the State Library made decisions about um, very strategic directions that we wanted to see libraries move in the state to um, help libraries really embrace the idea of resource sharing and collaboration um, that's ultimately led to some really, really fantastic programs like the Shared Catalog and Montana Library to go. Uh, we've been challenged in the last decade or so with having a, a lack of resources for new innovative uh, programs like that. Uh, the NAC was absolutely instrumental in decisions that we made with regard to some of the coal severance tax funds and the challenges the state libraries had there. Um, you know, it was the NAC that advised us on uh, deciding to end our contracts for the statewide databases and um, to repurpose some of those monies into the lifelong learning programs that have resulted in the Ready to Read program and some of our, our more recent um, maker kit work and economic development work and, and some of those kinds of programs. Um, we haven't had a lot of or sort of um, money to, to use to explore new opportunities, new pilots and new kinds of programs. And, and so uh, I, I am concerned that some of our work has become a little bit rote uh, and that does, I think, result in some complacency um, that as, as Bruce is saying really isn't what we intend for the Network Advisory Council really want this group to be very dynamic in advising the State Library about the 
needs immediate and long term that are really impacting your library uh, with the goal of helping us figure out how we can solve those challenges at a statewide level. Uh, we've talked within the Network Advisory Council and, and, and more broadly around the state about the idea of innovation, infrastructure, and engagement. And, and many of you have heard me say that the State Library really took that to heart. Uh, and I think the, the Network Advisory Council really is the group that can help us think about how we look at challenges that are affecting libraries around the state, innovative ways that we can address those challenges, what kinds of infrastructure might be necessary to help us address those challenges, uh, and, and how we can scale our responses to help benefit all libraries around the state. Uh, I, that, that's really, I think, at the heart of what the Network Advisory Council is. Uh, of course, much of that is technology and that kind of infrastructure, um, but a lot of it is also about how we can help support one another uh, through different kinds of programming opportunities and collection development and some of the, the other ways in which our libraries support our communities. Uh, so it's really those kinds of opportunities that we look to the NAC to lean in with the State Library to help us address. It's, it seems like the, the, the biggest challenge that the State Library and libraries, Montana libraries have generally um, in the upcoming year two or three is figuring out how to kind of do that that Biden campaign slogan build back better you know what what do we do after the um, after we have the the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic under control one way or the other uh, what do we do in preparation for the next the next one of these that we get but also what have we learned about um, alternative ways of providing uh, services to our, our patrons that perhaps actually um, uh, deepen, uh, extend our ability to take and, and do the right thing by, by Montanans. And um, I, would, I would, you know, we've been doing business more or less the same way for an awful long time as libraries. And we've, ha we've had sort of, um, we've been shaken by the, by the challenges of the, of, the, of the epidemic here. I think that we've learned a few things about about how to do things not different in the exclusion of how we used to do things but but different as new ways of, of getting to people and I would love to see us use use the um, I mean every cloud has a silver lining I mean maybe COVID-19 will 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 prompt us to to break out of our mold and and start doing things better to build back build libraries back better Bruce, from um, perspective of a person who's worked with the networking task force and then the NAC and been in libraries for 30 plus years, um, I always felt like the importance of the, the work that was done was it came from the communities to the state library. It never came from the state library to the com to to each community saying this is what's good for you, and the fact that there were all size libraries on the networking task force and that there still is, um, every community has a voice. I don't think we do as well today as we used to do with contact with each other and that is just the nature of what happens in libraries today. Everybody is so busy because the communities need the resources so badly that we don't, I don't think we, we spend that time learning from each other what each other needs. And that's really important because all of our needs are the same. They're just at a different level no matter what size the community or the library is, we still all have the same needs. Um, we just have to figure out a way to help kind of gradate those needs so that, that everybody gets what they need. 
in some ways, the successes of, of, of our networked efforts here in Montana have given us new challenges. So we just now need to, to surmount those challenges. I worry just a little bit that um, we've forgotten what it was like when we didn't have these kinds of collaborative resources at our fingertips. Um, we, we've, I worry that we've, take, we've come to take for granted uh, that we've always had these resource sharing tools and resources that we can rely on uh, and that we can rely on on one another for those services. Uh, and um, I don't think it's ever good to take those kinds of, of resources for granted because they were built on trust, they were built on relationships with one another and we need to keep up those relationships in order to make sure that the, the intent behind those resource sharing opportunities continues to be met. And I think, you know, I would be very interested in hearing from NAC members on how to structure this uh, in a way that allows you to really participate. You know, my memory of the, so just some of you know this, some of you may not, but I started working at the State Library in 2001 and I've had breaks in service. And I would go to the networking task force meetings and it was a kind of a smaller group but it was a very lively, active group. I remember a lot of spirited debate. And I think over time, we wanted to make sure we had better representation. And so it grew bigger. And of course, sometimes what happens when a group grows bigger is it's a little bit harder for every voice to participate. And so if there are ways that we can structure this so that you can participate and you feel comfortable participating, I think that's going to be a good thing. And the other thing I think I've learned over the last year is the power of kind of having great ideas. And it's amazing how suddenly the resources or the potential to get resources might show up. And, you know, a couple of examples of those are Suzanne and Kara had nudged me about mobile hotspots and I knew that the Lewis and Clark Library was doing that and a couple of other libraries and so we started asking libraries about that and it seemed to be a need like Kanor said it was coming up from the communities and then COVID <clears throat> hit and all of a sudden we had an opportunity to get a lot of funding and I mean we have like $600,000 to deploy mobile hotspots and devices. And that's because somebody had the idea and planted the seed. And that's what I would love from the NAC is just kind of those ideas even, and I think we have a tendency to go, oh, we don't have the resources. So let's just give up or let's go with the status quo. And that's too bad because sometimes when we have those great ideas, then the doors start opening and to be able to be positioned with some ideas from you as a group coming up from your libraries and your work and what you're seeing as needs, you know, you'd be amazed at what we might be able to do. And I think I would be very grateful to kind of have those ideas in place and to try and pursue them. Well, when, when, when um, Tracy or Jenny, I can't remember who asked if I would kind of lead off with sort of a, um, a Codger's reminiscences, uh, uh, I was delighted to do it. Um, if there are things that occur to people, uh, it'd be good to kind of keep the conversation going. Um, but I think that we're at 930 and uh, I feel like, uh, I don't want to take forever kind of talking about what was. I'd rather start doing what is. But um, thank you for the chance to, to, to share some really fond memories that I have uh, about working with the State Library and working with Montana librarians. I, I will say that when I first came to Montana to work at the State Library in 1980, I figured I'd be here for two or three years and go back to my native state of Oregon 
but I fell in love with uh, Montana, but I mostly fell in love with Montana librarians. Well, actually I married one, but uh, aside from that, uh, you know, just the, uh, the willingness to take risks and to trust each other and to work harder than, than, um, and was required by by the job description that that just totally blew me away and still blows me away and it has been a privilege to to work with work with Montana librarians and Montana libraries. Thanks, Bruce. Really appreciate your your reminiscences, your thoughts, and insights. I I hope it's useful for our members of the NAC to understand a little bit about the history and uh, how this group was formed, where it came from. Uh, because in many ways, it's our hope of where we continue to go in the future. Are there any, any questions for Bruce or uh, maybe even Hanor, the rest of us, before we get started with the agenda? I just think it's really great that communities in Montana have the opportunity to be part of government that's not political. Mm -hmm. And um, every community in Montana has that opportunity through the state library. I know many of you have the opportunity to work with colleagues around the country. In my work with other state librarians, um, I, I hear grave concerns from state librarians about uh, a lack of trust that libraries have of the state library or just a, um, a sense that the state libraries are irrelevant. I'm grateful we don't have that in Montana, uh, but more so just a um, much more of an independent streak, I guess I would say, than what we uh, maybe have in Montana. I always say that I think it's that neighbor helping neighbor mentality that, that comes with um, Montanans, uh, we really do rely on one another and we're there to support one another in ways that I certainly don't see uh, in discussions with my colleagues around the country. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, just a quick example, um, we put up pretty quickly after the pandemic hit an online calendar where libraries could share some of their online programming events and promote those events with other libraries around the state, recognizing that we have an opportunity to support patrons all across the state, not just in our local communities. And um, that kind of online calendar idea was met with significant resistance in other parts of the country. And uh, I just think it would make our work that much harder if we had to deal with that kind of uh, relationship building at, especially at times like this when we just want to roll up our sleeves and get work done. Great. If there's no further discussion, let's go ahead and move into the um, business of the day. This is the retreat for the Network Advisory Council. So this, this is a, a meeting where we really do try to roll up our sleeves and um, think very deliberately about the work that we want to accomplish in the coming year. Um, the structure of the agenda today is designed to get significant feedback from all of you as we approach some of the needs that are facing us immediately, as well as some of the things that we've been discussing with the Network Advisory Council and librarians. Uh, for the past year or so, uh, we're ready to start taking some action and need your input as we begin to take those steps. So um, a lot of the agenda, as you can see, is based on that NAC discussion and we welcome your, your full participation in that. Let's go ahead and start with introductions. Uh, and I'm going to, I hope, call on you to try to keep uh, keep us in order as we go through introductions. I know this can be a little bit challenging um, in the online meeting format. So if you could introduce yourself, let us know where you're from and what library you're from and who you represent as a member on the Network Advisory Council. 
Uh, again, I'm Jenny Stapp. I've been the state librarian since about 2012. Really glad to be with you today. And is that Bruce? Tenor, do you want to introduce yourself? You're muted. I love it when it tells you you are mute. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Hanor Bray. I'm the director of Missoula Public Library. Um, I've been there for just about 16 years. And prior to that was the director of the Anaconda Library. And prior to that in school libraries in Eastern Montana. Just going down the list in the order that you appear on my screen. So Kit, you're next. Hi, I am Kit Stevenson. I'm the assistant director at the Bozeman Public Library, and I've been here for five years this month. <laughs> um, and I represent the MLA board. I'm the president-elect there, and I can't wait to see the new Missoula Library. Tracy? I am Tracy Cook with the Montana State Library. I'm a lead consulting and learning librarian. Jessica. I am Jessica Edwards, data coordinator for the State Library. Kate. I don't think we have your audio. Also introduce yourself in chat. Kate. Kara. Hello, I'm Kara Orban. I'm the consortia director at the State Library and I have her since 2012. Marlis. Marlis Stark with the State Library and um, I'm just the person that sits in and listens. Appreciate your help. Catherine? Catherine, do you have audio? It shows that you're muted. don't have audio, you're welcome to put a greeting in the chat. I'm waiting for her. Jennifer, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jennifer Burnell. I am the Montana Memory Project Director for the State Library. Belinda? I'm Belinda Potter and I am the librarian at MSU Northern. I represent small academic libraries and I've been working at Northern for almost 20 years. Thanks, Belinda. Amy? And Amy, you may still be muted. It was muted. Thank you. Um, this is Amy Martrick. I am the lead system administrator for the Montana Shared Catalog at the State Library. Nancy? Nancy doesn't have audio. She's posted in chat. I directed the Laurel Public Library for 13 years, been at Laurel for 25, and she's the Federation Coordinator Representative. Thanks, Nancy. 
Joy. Good morning. My name is Joy Bridwell. I'm the library director at Stone Child College Rocky Boy Community Library in Box Elder, and I am the tribal library representative. Thanks, Joy. Mitch? Uh, I didn't realize I had to introduce myself because I'm not on the committee, but I'm Mitch Grady from Livingston Park County Public Library. And I've Great. been here since 2015, and before that I was at Hearst Free Library, and then before that I was at Missoula Public Library. That was in 2006. Thanks, Mitch. Glad you could join us. Mitch also serves on the Public Library Standards Task Force. Pamela? Good morning, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is Pamela uh, Benjamin. I'm the coordinator for trails. Um, and I'm coming up on five years uh, in this position. Pam. I'm Pam Henley, one of the consulting librarians with the State Library and for almost seven years now. And before that, I was at Bozeman Public. Ben. Morning, everyone. My name is Ben Chapasa. I'm with the Marine and Mike Mansfield Library at the University of Montana. Um, I started working at the library in 2015 as a cataloger, but right now I'm the government information librarian, and I function as our state's regional depository coordinator, um, providing um, that guidance on an intermedi intermediary communications between the government publishing office and our 12 depository libraries throughout our state. Stacy. Stacy's also posted in the chat. She's the director of the Fountain County Library, represents small libraries. And Sonia is with her. Hello, Sonia. Jody. I'm Jody Smiley, and I am with the Boulder Community Library. I've been the um, been with the Boulder Community Library since 2007, and I just have to say thank you all for the hotspots. Oh. They have been a lifesaver. <laughs> Glad to hear. Sarah. Hi, good morning everyone. This is Sarah McLean. I work at the State Law Library and coming up on four years, and I am here to represent special libraries. Suzanne. I'm Suzanne Reimer. I'm a statewide consulting librarian with the State Library. John. Good morning. This is John Kilgour, Branson Contracts Coordinator at the State Library. Who did I miss? I saw Evan earlier. Is Evan still with us? Hi, Susie. You want to introduce yourself? I am Susie McIntyre. I'm the director of the Great Falls Public Library. I've worked here since I think 2005. Um, and before that, I worked at special libraries, and I am, uh, I represent, I'm an at large representative. Did I miss anyone else? All right, thanks again. I want to encourage any of you who have video cameras to please use your video cameras. Um, today's agenda is really structured around a lot of discussion and having the ability to see and interact with one another, I think is gonna uh, help facilitate that discussion in a much more real way. So if you have cameras, please feel free to use them. Um, the first order of business is approval of the minutes from your May 28th meeting. Are, are there any corrections or additions to those minutes?
If not, is there a motion to approve those minutes? Feel free to unmute yourself. I so move. That's Susie McIntyre. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Kay. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye or post aye in the chat. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thanks, the minutes are approved. We wanted to start off the day by going back to our discussion from May about the impact that the pandemic is having on libraries. Uh, we've got some questions posed in the agenda that we hope will shape our discussion. Uh, one of the the uh, key points I wanted to make sure and share with all of you is that um, when we went back to the Public Library Standards Task Force in May, uh, the intent for that meeting originally was for the, the task force to uh, approve a draft version of the standards that would then go to the commission for them to move into the administrative rules process to adopt the new public library standards. And uh, we really felt at that time that uh, what we knew about the pan pandemic was obviously shaping the direction of library services in ways that we really couldn't understand and didn't have the proper perspective on to be able to make uh, informed decisions about how the pandemic might change or influence some of the public library standards. So at the recommendation of the task force, we decided to suspend that process uh, until at least this fall, hoping that by then we would have some time to think more deliberately about what we've learned about library services in light of the pandemic and whether or not we need to that, therefore make additional changes to the standards. So at this point in time, uh, that process is uh, temporarily on hold. We plan to meet with the Public Library Standards Task Force again next month. Uh, and I hope at that time to have some more perspective about what we know about impacts to library services and whether or not we need to continue to modify those draft standards moving forward. So we, we've delayed that overall timeline. We did invite members of that task force to participate in today's discussion uh, to hear your input about uh, how libraries are changing we're learning as we go through this pandemic. So again, I want to thank Mitch for joining us today. Um, we will continue to evaluate these questions with all of you, as well as with the Public Library Standards Task Force, as we continue the process to adopt revised standards in the future. I just wanted to share that information with all of you. Uh, we've included in your meeting materials the notes that we took from May's discussion, and again, uh, want to continue that overall discussion about the impacts that you're seeing in your libraries uh, and how that might shape uh, our responses in helping to continue to support libraries. Are there any comments from the notes from May's meeting?
Smiles. When we met in May, we'd been uh, responding to pandemic and some of our libraries were still closed or just beginning to reopen. Uh, we've been ex dealing with these experiences for uh, not quite two months at that point. Um, staff are getting used to working remotely. Some of you had, had um, been working on projects that you now had time to do. Uh, we were re responding to increases in service needs like Montana Library to Go demand. Um, have you seen the need for these kinds of services to continue or uh, has the, the prolonged nature of the pandemic um, caused you to change or rethink how you are responding? You know, Jenny, this is Bruce. I've been, I've been thinking about this, of course, a, a lot. Um, I, I don't have any specific suggestions, but I have some general suggestions and I, I'm hoping that, that, that NAC members will have some specific ideas uh, related to this. Seems to me that there's a couple of principles um, that we should remember. One is that you eat an elephant a, bread, a bite at a time. We don't have to do it all at once. Uh, two is that uh, low hanging fruit it may not be the most important thing, but if we can just kind of do something and it's valuable, maybe we ought to do that and just kind of continue to sort of incrementally move away. Um, what was the third thing? I don't recall. I'm sorry, but but um, it it we we ought to we 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 should we should identify you know, what's, what the easy stuff to do is. Oh, the third thing is, is we should build on strengths. And, you know, there's, there's a number of things that we know are valuable to our, to our libraries and to our users, uh, such as the shared catalog and Montana Library to Go and Montana Memory Project, et cetera. And, and, and unless for some reason they would be proved un, un, less valuable, I think that those are things that we can kind of work on and then keep our eyes open for new opportunities. Sorry for my little memory fart there. So, so hopefully NAC members will take in, in, in what are the low hanging fruits and what are our strengths that are valuable and how can they be built upon. Well, my goal for this meeting was to not talk too much. So I'm going to start off by being one of the first to talk. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think when when I am looking at this list and when I am thinking about the library, I think one of our biggest frustrations is that we can see a bunch of needs in the community, um, but not just that we don't have the staff and the resources to do it, but we can't figure out how to do it safely. Like we, we're trying to figure out how we're going to run the bookmobile um, to the colonies and to the small schools and keep six foot distancing, and which is impossible on the bookmobile, and yet those schools really need us. And and, and so I, I think it's really easy for me. I notice that I just kind of get bogged down in the minutiae details of how to try to do something. Um, and then that feels a little bit overwhelming um, because we see stuff that needs to be done, but we don't know how to do it safely. First, Susie, that's your strength that you're willing to go first, because that's what the group needs is someone to go first. Um, and second, you are not alone. I have heard that theme again and again. And I think for librarians, it's kind of one of the biggest struggles I've heard is this desire to serve and um, not knowing how to do that safely. And, and sometimes having to literally make the choice to not serve mm -hmm. because there is no way to do it safely. What is the experience of other NAC members? I mean, this is an opportunity for us to 
I guess, take control of our future. And, you know, it can feel like there's no way of taking control because it's a global pandemic. The fact is, though, if we put our minds to it, we can figure out some at least baby steps, as Bruce said. What do others see? This is Sarah. Um, I think in the last meeting, I noted it built for the law library. We're kind of preparing for an increase um, in need for assistance with landlord tenant matters and um, other things related to, to people um, dealing with new poverty issues, more um, severe issues. Um, but I also wanted to note that along with the pandemic, you know, or um, some other major, major issues are, have arisen and are, con and continue to, uh, you know, challenge us, which is good. But, um, well, one, so what, a way that we kind of gauge that at the law library is by looking at what people are calling with for our reference librarian. And a lot of the calls we get forwarded from the attorney general's office. So I think that's people want to know and they call the AG's office, but then they just transfer them right to us. So I just wanted to note that um, people are there. I mean, and this is all over the board, but with the news cycle, we get a lot of calls, whether it's, you know, about masks or um, guns. We continue to get a lot of calls about gun rights, um, uh, all kinds of things. So there's definitely the sense of, of kind of, I don't know if civil unrest is the correct term, but, um, you know, in addition to the regular needs um, of, you know, that people are dealing with in their legal matters, that um, has been present for us. And how have you responded to that, Sarah? What are some of the ways that you've provided service? Um, well, so Christine Mandeleff is our reference librarian and um, she is an attorney and she, so she is, you know, really familiar or very practiced at that, just providing information, not advice. Um, but we do have to reach out to stakeholders sometimes, whether that's court staff, or um, again with, um, well, court staff or other people that are referring to us um, to help assist them with their messaging. Uh, for example, we'll get calls and people will say, well, such and such office told me that you'll give me the forms to sue the governor. Of course, we don't do that <laughs> um, and we don't have those specific forms, but so it's, um, you know, there's, it's working together as our staff and then with, you know, our stakeholders who are give, um, providing references. And then as possible, Christine, um, we, we kind of, we, we may, you know, use the made up for packetized information. So if we know that, wow, everybody's calling about masks right now, then we just get a little packet of information that's not, you know, we don't need to go beyond what the governor's office has already provided, but if his letters, you know, reference statute, then we can, or I mean, his orders reference a, a statute, then we can put copies of that so people can look at it, you know, we're not giving any opinion about it, but um, just being prepared with that kind of stuff. So yeah, we do gather those kind of frequently asked questions, um, just so that Christina doesn't have to reinvent the wheel and then we can triage some of those questions without having to get them to her. So that was kind of a rambling, but I hope that, I hope that makes sense. This is Jody Smiley from the Boulder Community Library. And I feel that the strengths of Montana libraries lie within the librarians' passion for their communities and to serve their communities. Um, but one thing that we never did before, but we're starting to do now, is we've um, teamed up with um, St. James Hospital. And if they have um, Boulder residents that need to be seen, we're doing telemed in our work office. Mm -hmm. And it's just, one way to keep our county in our county to help not spread the virus 
and we actually had a pretty good response with that and that's why one of the reasons why i love the hotspot is they can take it away in private and have that talk and then bring it back That's, That's really it. Go ahead, Kara. Sorry. No. <laughs> I can't see you, Tracy, so I don't know. I know this is going on long enough. I need the external webcam. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask Jody, uh, how frequently have people used hotspots for that purpose? Um, we've we just started teaming up with St. James two weeks ago, and we've had seven telemed um, uses with the hotspot. My neighbor's a doc, and she has been doing. Um, a lot of virtual medicine in the last several months. She thinks that even with a, a vaccine that, that she probably will uh, continue to use a lot, to do a lot of virtual medicine in the future. Uh, maybe the libraries have a role in that. Um, that's pretty interesting to hear, hear what you say, Jody. And it also seems to me to be a, maybe a model for, for libraries that, you know, uh, we may find some things we're doing now are are great and that we want to keep on doing them. Sarah, sadly, I wasn't surprised to hear you sort of describe a little bit of the, the civil disobedience kinds of reactions that you're seeing from patrons. That's certainly something that we've heard about in the COVID check-ins in our COVID community of practice. And, and librarians have shared responses uh, that they're using in communication with employees. My sense is that um, the pandemic is only heightening some of the uh, lack of civil, civil discourse that we've been hearing in our communities for some time. Uh, it's heightening that um, it, it's kind of drawing it to a point right now uh, with some very targeted reactions to how people are responding to the pandemic. But uh, we've talked for several years now and it's a priority within our LSTA plan to uh, help think about how we can support libraries in their work to support both civil and civic engagement. Um, the need is only intensified, I would think. Uh, I'm wonder, wondering about uh, some of your reactions to any kinds of changing behaviors you're seeing from your patrons in that regard. Well, I would just say that I, I feel like there's a level of exhaustion from the staff, um, you know, constantly. I feel like we spend a lot of our time when we're open telling people, please have your mask cover your nose and your mouth. Please have your mask cover your nose and your mouth. And, um, you know, getting pushback and snottiness. And that's, um, that's exhausting to have to do that all day. Um, but at the same time, it's really important because you don't, want to help somebody if their mask is down around their chin and um, I just it, it, it's making our relationships with our um, patrons more difficult. And along the staff um, part of the conversation I I'm worried about the mental health of our staff. Um, and I think that seems to be coming out even stronger right now, I guess, since we've opened up. We, ha we haven't had too many problems with people wearing their masks. We, we've, we've done okay here in Bozeman. Um, 
but in general, I see a lot of anxiety. And I think when we talk about civil discourse, I think when everyone's experiencing so much anxiety with today's current events, it's just hard to kind of grab onto that idea of civil discourse and when there's like some mental health issues <laughs> happen mm -hmm. when some people haven't experienced that before and now they are so um that's something that's been on my mind a lot um so working on that <laughs> i'd like to speak to that civil discourse um idea something popped into my head and i i just kind of want to like brainstorm it with people and throw it out there and feel free to tear it down and tell me why it's um, stupid. <laughs> but basically, um, I, I'm starting to think, well, so what can libraries practically do um, considering the period we're in and the period I suspect we're about to go into, which is not going to be good. Um, it's going to be like the depression, possibly worse, I would think, because now we've got pandemic as well as job loss and homelessness um, and mental health issues. I would say suicides, I'm sure, are going to rise dramatically, not to be the bear of good news, but that's mm -hmm. my perspective. I, I, that's what it seems like was coming to me. Um, so what, what can libraries do? What can libraries do across the board, not just public, but academic and school? I, I, I think there are a couple areas. One, just talking about this makes me think, Kit, that maybe you probably already have it at the ready, but it seems like we should be super prepared with um, referrals to mental health services. And I imagine, like I said, many already are, but that should be like ready to go or even up on the site. Um, and another thing that I'm hearing immediately, I mean, right now, is, is this real problem with um, information literacy, media literacy, et cetera. Um, and as, if you talk to the experts in AI or what their biggest concern is, um, sorry, my dog just came up. They, all of them almost seem to unanimously think that deep fakes are going to be our big problem coming up. And that, of course, will probably be relegated to, to AI and algorithms to handle it. But then it's just going to be an arms battle going back and forth between devising this not very, and, and devising a, a way around it and back and forth. But if people don't even know where they can get authoritative information from, and they're increasingly apparently having a problem with this, um, even people that know their way around are getting confused. Why aren't, I, I would feel like libraries, librarians can step into that breach. There's a, no one seems to be stepping forward and going, hey, I mean, it, mainstream media is under attack. A lot of people apparently don't trust it. Um, do they trust libraries still? And if they don't, shouldn't they? Um, and why aren't we claiming that? That should be, that's our territory. We should take it, I think, and become, you know, a source for the community to turn to when they're like, I, yeah, just an idea. I, I'd be curious to hear what other people um, think about that. Oh, plus, sorry, one more thing. I was thinking this would, might, might be, it could be an effort, not that anyone has the time or energy, energy to do it, but it would be uh, an effort that could be done jointly across the board. I mean, publics can contribute to this. Um, uh, academics can contribute to this. K-12 can contribute to this. We all have this issue in one way or another with our users, I think. Emma, thanks so much for sharing. <laughs> it got me thinking a lot. This has been, um, so I, I totally agree with what you're saying about why I, I personally am noticing, like, am kind of saddened by the fact that amidst all this information literacy needs environment, um, this need for health literacy and um, needs of addressing misinformation that on the national scale, I, I'm confused why we're not seeing more librarians, library professionals, information professionals leading the charge. Um, and that makes me question, you know, the societal lens placed upon um, library, uh, our profession in general. Um, and it, it does concern me. Um, so yeah, I, I do, um, 
you're preaching to the choir in the sense that why are is our profession not really leading the charge in that? Um, and I, I'm still thinking about that to this day. Um, another thing you brought up um, regarding mental health, and I think about how with all these anxieties um, perking up in, in both our staffing and our communities, and I think about the comment made earlier about um, civil disobedience and masks, the, the thought that popped up in my head is how we will go about handling de-escalation and how I think about the role of libraries and police, like what that partnership will look like amid, you know, the BLM movement and um, how, how that kind of comes into picture. And I think about how, how can libraries best do de-escalation work that more aligns with um, transformative justice rather than, you know, letting our anxieties um, push us towards um, a method of, of escalating via, you know, directly contacting um, law enforcement or policing to address de-escalation. So that's what um, I think about immediately with your comment, how we can think about that collectively, knowing the, the difficulties of wrangling with our own anxieties and our patrons' anxieties. It, it comes to mind that the, prim, the, the first rule of storytelling is show, don't tell, right? So, so it may be now, there's, no, there's nothing that takes and, and alerts the listener um, to a, a coming fraud that, when someone says, trust me, you know, I'm from a library, trust me. So, so it strikes me that our strategies, um, uh, I'm with Pam, that uh, clearly we have a role, but we probably need to do it by just by um, ro rolling out, um, uh, ro rolling out programs or, or whatever it is that, that allow, um, that, that will take, that, that will take and promote the whole notion of, of um, information literacy, et cetera, uh, uh, but, but not kind of preach about it. And that'll be the trick. I, I see what you mean about, I guess, you know, not preaching, but I do think if it was a combined effort, it wasn't just coming out of public libraries. It wasn't just coming from K-12. I think if, we all put it together and, and you know, let it be known that we as a group en masse in the entire state support this and r reminding people there is a place, there is someone you can go to when you're not sure what you're looking at. I guess my other, my other question is, um, do, is that something that people would want? Probably right now, they're gonna have immediate needs and, and they're not gonna be going, hey, library, help me with figuring out whether this is true or not. Because frankly, I don't care if it matches my viewpoint, so I'm going with it. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's a real problem too. I mean, maybe that's a longer term picture of the issue to, to deal with, but you're right. I mean, it's probably gonna be the most immediate social needs um, it's going to it's going to be food and family and jobs and home hopefully can you hear me this time jenny yes okay good um this is kate and um it, obviously the schools um are we're just now starting to really dive into the details and figure out what this is going to look like in the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months. Um, and so I have a bunch of things swirling around in my head um, and you know, hopefully we can model what we do somewhat after what we've seen the public libraries do um, and all of the great things that you've already kind of figured out. Um, a couple of things I just wanna mention is I think we're gonna really see the need for flexibility in our resources, just like you all have already. And some of our schools have that flexibility and have those resources available in many forms and some of them don't. And so that's um, going to be a struggle for some of our libraries. Uh, and then I do think, I really agree with Pamela that um, there will be a need for us to step in and have a more um, cohesive set of 
um, curriculum and, and instruction for digital literacy. And the problem I think is that I, I think what most of librarian, most school librarians are worried about is how we can fit in um, to what teachers are trying to do already and um, how we can make time for that because I think they're, they're so overwhelmed with, with what they're doing. So there will be a lot of technology support, I imagine, at the beginning. Um, I see that that's gonna, going to be the first need for us. Um, and then from that point, hopefully we can make sure that they know how to get a, a hold of the resources that we have available. And then within the, the first month or so, um, really start making those connections to just information literacy. And, um, and I'd really be open to that, that um, connection with both academic libraries and public libraries and how that could be a, a cohesive um, approach, so. And that's part of our conversation right now is how to support the schools. Um, we're definitely thinking about that um, just since, um, well, Monday, Bozeman Public Schools announced how they were gonna um, manage their opening. Um, and so we've just definitely been thinking, you know, maybe try to get tutor.com um, and things that can support um, students. Um, so, you know, building that relationship is really important for us, definitely right now with schools. Kate, could you say more about flexibility in resources and what that looks like for schools? Uh, I think just the, you know, in, in Helena, we, we don't even really know exactly what our opening is going to look at, like yet. We're, we're still hold, holding on that, but I know that many of the schools have um, made that decision and some of them are online, some of them are a hybrid model, some of them are face-to-face -face, or at least initially that's their plan. Um, and so we've started thinking about what will student access look like as far as our resources and our space even. I, we're not even really sure if our students will be allowed in our space, um, the physical space. And so that's still a big question. Um, but if they, whether they are or they aren't, how they can utilize our databases, how they can um, access our audiobooks, how they can access our, our ebooks, and or how we can do some sort of curbside, you know, delivery or deliver books to their, their classrooms if they're not allowed to come to our, our libraries. I think many of the elementary libraries are their specialists, their librarians are going to be going to classrooms. Um, and so instead of their kids coming to them, they will be going out into the classrooms, which will be a big shift for them. And um, so I guess just trying to manage all those things. And, and in my particular library, we have a lot of resources that are available to them electronically, and we are in a pretty good position. I think we are unique. I do not think that that is true of most libraries school libraries. I think many of them are still struggling to um, provide those resources in a way that students can access them, whether they have access to the physical library or not. And so that is a concern. And um, I think it will be, I think it'll be a challenge for school libraries to, to be used as much as they are when our doors are open, obviously. And I think that, I'm sure that's true of every library. Um, we're just not, I just don't see us having a whole lot of priority as far as the financial resources to make sure that those things can happen. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. kind of begs the question, what can we do to help? Or can, should we be helping or whatever? I would agree with that, Bruce. And then the other 
thing I would like to point out is Suzanne mentioned the experience with the interest group devoted to information literacy. And I think that kind of leads me to a question about what is holding us back from doing that? I think this was Ben's question. And is it fear? Is it fear of failure? Is it fear of being attacked? Because unfortunately, we're living in times where sometimes people attack first and ask questions later. What is it that is keeping us from doing these things? Because those are the barriers we need to address so that we can do these things. Well, I think for, for me, one of the things that I'm thinking about is like, so what does that actually look like? Do we know what works? How do we know we're successful? Um, you know, the, we did a series of um, programs about um, the news and information literacy in the fall. And we had, you know, 12 people or 14 people. And, um, you know, is that effective? I, you know, for those people, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, our Facebook page information tends to get drowned out. I, I guess, like, I would love to dig into information literacy, um, but I, I guess I don't know what the best practices are. Like, what? how would we practically roll that out? And then what would be our measures of success? Because I, I feel like right now in the age of COVID, I don't even know how to say if a program is <laughs> successful or not, because it's like, oh, well, we had... 15 people online and we normally have 50 come in person and is that good bang for my buck or should I have her working on something else? I, I just, I, I feel like part of my inertia is not knowing the best way to do stuff and how to measure it. Throwing out an idea. One of the things that we've talked here about here today and, and we've talked about in the COVID check-ins is just um, patron behavior and our staff's reaction to that patron behavior. Uh, we all bring excellent information literacy skills uh, and a lot of this is, as Pamela was saying, is less about information literacy skills and uh, more about uh, politicized points of view and a general and maybe intentional attempt to undermine trusted resources like the media. Uh, I, would, I would put information professionals in that category, uh, an attempt to undermine science and, and fact-based views. Uh, I think one way where I might evaluate or measure success in attempting to respond effectively to information literacy needs and also um, just um, the, that, that kind of civil disobedience is knowing that I and, and my staff feel well prepared to respond to questions and potential criticisms that we can effectively de-escalate situations when they arise and point people to information resources, whether or not they use those information resources, um, but that we not only have, have those skills and abilities, but that we sort of hold fast and hold true to that role that we have always played, uh, that we embrace the idea that we are trusted professionals and regardless of the political dialogue, we're going to continue to uh, point people to and try to promote those kinds of authoritative resources on this point and perhaps in the future uh, in our communities, we see a decrease in those kinds of challenges that might be coming to our libraries uh, and, and others in our community pointing to us as that kind of trusted professional.
I also wanted to comment briefly on the concerns about mental health, especially amongst staff. We've spent some time at the Federation meetings over the last year bringing in trainers. And I, Tracy, I need a reminder, I can't remember the name of the organization that we've been working with. CIT, Crisis Intervention Training. Yes. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we can minimally do and, and promote more is information about that program, uh, as well as other kinds of mental health resources. Uh, one of the things that had occurred to me last fall after listening to one of those trainings is that um, the State Library needs to, to make a map of all of the mental health resources that are available around the state. And we need to make sure that that's available in your hands. So you know who to, to refer your staff to, who to refer your patrons to, um, when those immediate situations arise. The crisis intervention training is about dealing with mental health challenges in the moment um, and making sure that people know who they can call when those kinds of situations arise. So one other um, comment I have about mental health that just sprang to mind was I, I've been talking with colleagues and friends around the country who hold leadership positions in our field and their, their ethos really revolves around um, thinking about how, thinking about how we all acknowledge that we're in really unprecedented and unusual times and as such we really need to not accidentally steer towards this sense of urgency to be um, hyper hyper productive, um, and it's hard for our profession because we're we're so you know gung ho about you know helping our patrons in needs, maneuvering around these barriers and difficulties. But at the end of the day, um, acknowledging too that hey, why why do I feel down? Why do I feel depressed? Oh, <laughs> we're in a pandemic. So that, that constant reminder um, individually and a constant reminder for um, our staffing if you're in a supervisor role, I think is really critical. Um, and I fear that now that it's been a couple months since we were amid all of this, that we're in this hyper productivity mindset when in actuality, we should take the moment to um, you know, uh, promote and do self care and to recognize that um, it's unusual times. So if we're not meeting, we're not at the same level of productivity, the same level of um, innovation, I think that should be okay. And I think we should embrace that as well. And I, I agree with you, Ben. I'd also kind of like to point out that a lot of our frontline staff, um, you know, qualify as low paid essential workers. I mean, our, you know, I think the clerks at the Great Falls Public Library get paid abysmally and, um, you know, they, they, um, they're interacting with 300 people a day and, um, you know, that level of burnout is, is really, you know, on the same level of, of all the other people that are having to, to go to work and, and hopefully we're protecting them well, but, um, I, I think that that is another issue that that we don't actually talk about is that um, we have a lot of people that aren't 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 paid particularly well to be you know out here interacting with so many people and putting themselves at risk. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And you know, go, besides the simple risk that that they're uh, exposing themselves to. There has to be, um, well, there is a great deal of uh, stress that goes with that. And then they're um, confronted, I, I know, by people who are yelling at them because they're being asked to wear masks. So what a tough deal. Yeah, one way we're kind of trying to address that is having everyone where 
from our whole library kind of down on the floor, you know, I'm down there, our department heads are down there, other departments are, um, and, and so I think it's helped our frontline staff feel a little bit more like a, a big team, you know, it's not just them. It's not up to them to deal with the people angry or anything like that. So it's one way we've been trying to to fix that. That's um, fantastic, Kit. Yeah, yeah, it's helped. I can feel it, you know, um, yeah. And I was gonna say something else about, um, about programs and um, Susie was talking about feeling if they're effective or not online and we struggle with that too. And I think that's been my big question during all this is, you know, in our mission statement, we have, you know, we're really trying to help people connect that whole connection thing. And right now that's lost. And I think with mental health, it's like, oh, that could help, but we can't do it. Um, so it's something we're trying to figure out is how can we help people connect, even if it's online and that that's really hard. Um, so I did want to say mention that because Susie Susie made me think about that. Kit, do you think it would be helpful or just like too random or whatnot to be putting out options for just general community discussions? I mean. Are there people out there that are feeling isolated that don't have anywhere to turn to that aren't going to utilize the normal like mental health avenues that are set up for them? Um, a lot of people don't like that free form stuff because you don't know what you're going to get. But, you know, is that and, and would people attend? I don't know. But, you know, if it's something that you put out there as an opportunity for people to come in and keeping it casual and formal and just to talk about whatever, maybe that would serve a need. I don't know. Are you, are you talking about virtually? Or yes. In, yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Always virtually. <laughs> cool. um, it is something, you know, like we've been having book club meetings virtually and that has been a place for people to kind of gather and talk even beyond the book. So that's been, so I think it's something that we're thinking about more and more of, of a, you know, like, one idea is having a cooking class where there's somebody teaching it, but everybody virtually taking it can be cooking as well, you know, and then they get to, you know, just talk about it. I don't know. I mean, I know that seems <laughs> um, light, but it's at least a connection. That's what I've been thinking about is programming like that. So yes, I think that's a great idea, Pam. <laughs> Are you hearing? Oh, Pam, you're muted. Pamela, you're muted. Okay. Are you hearing patrons ask for things that are surprising you or uh, maybe you haven't thought about before? I don't feel like that. I, I feel like a lot of our patrons have kind of um, retrenched back to the core. I mean, when we first opened, people were just so grateful to have access to books. <laughs> I mean, it was like when we first reopened, it was just everything we could do to give people books and DVDs. And, um, and I haven't had people asking for more stuff except for, um, you know, computer help, which we've always had um, people asking for. Um, and we do have job service coming in now. Um, they, they're not open yet. So they're actually using our small meeting room to help people for um, a couple hours every day that we're open. And that's a really good partnership. Um, but I, I don't, Maybe other people have patrons asking for more stuff, but I feel like, especially early on, people were just really focused on, oh my God, I need something to read. Yeah, 
Yeah, we had a lot of comments that, you know, we're so isolated and we can't even read a book. You know? <laughs> Actually, I have a question um, for you guys. Has the overdrive usage gone through the roof or did it initially and then it's sloped back down or? We peaked in April. It's still quite high, but it's gradually diminishing. I think that's summer. I really do. I mean, people have found other outlets and I think this fall it's going to really pick up again in my opinion. If you're interested, I'm going to drop a a uh, link in the chat to our statistics dashboard for Montana Library to go so you can get a look at how it's being used. Early on in the pandemic, especially when libraries were talking about closing their facilities there were lots of questions about whether or not libraries were essential services, what it might mean to our stakeholders and funders if libraries were closed. I know several of us spent quite a bit of time thinking about those questions, thinking about the language that we we're using to talk about our services. Uh, I'm wondering if you have heard or continue to hear any kind of reactions from your funding bodies, your governing bodies about um, libraries response during the pandemic, this question of what is essential, what is not essential, any other concerns they might be expressing in that regard, or concerns that you might have specifically as it relates to communicating the value of libraries during Are you concerned at all that libraries perceived values might be taking a hit during the pandemic? Or, or the opposite? Are there successes that we can point to to demonstrate libraries value? I would think the this is Mark from Bitterroot. I would think that one hit that we're taking is maybe just on the political divide about masks of us being on the side of requiring people to have those and people viewing us as, you know, a kind of arm of the deep state that's trying to infringe on their freedoms. So. Well, we all know that's true, Mark. I guess I don't feel like they're devaluing us any more than they did before, but I feel like the pie is getting smaller in terms of the resources. And um, so I'm feeling like people are really focused on making sure that um, police and fire have what they need. I have heard that some libraries are pressured by their local government um, to open or to close or or whatever, um, and it that may be sort of an indirect measure of what you were asking about, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, definitely a concern in the schools. I think the um, the classes that do not fit within that core group, music, PE, library. Um, I think there's great concern about whether or not those will, those classes will be allowed to continue and continue in the same way and have the same priority. 
Um, so I, I think there's there's definitely concern there. Seems like we shouldn't, you know, let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. Again, enter, enter the breach, enter the void, take up the slack, um, especially now. And, and to Susie's point about, you don't feel like they are taking you any more for granted than they did previously, right? And that's kind of like, yeah, that's, we just accept that and that attitude. See, that's where I feel like we need to change that and go in now, even though we're all exhausted though. I understand everyone's tired and um, limited staff, limited resources. But it seems like it, you know it's it's an opportunity to be to be taken to to come in and and be there and be a kind of a social support and a network for the community on that social aspect and then on the the fact I don't know defenders of facts and science those wacky things that people seem to be able to deny right now um, and it, the thing is that that's going to require us to stick our necks out a bit uh, more than maybe we're comfortable with and you don't want to have a sit there and have a discussion or ar argument with your patron but you know what sometimes demanding times call for whatever i i don't know what else to say i mean you're there to serve the community but in this case the community seems to not know what's fact or fiction and they they need someone to to help them with that without preaching Well, we also have the question of access. If if they're not able to come into the library, is they, everybody able to access the information that we're sharing? Um, that that's kind of a big, big one. And the hotspots has been a great um, program. I do worry, like maybe maybe the schools are going to do some stuff with access like they did at the end of the school year last year but i worry oh we just check a hot spot out for two weeks and then that person has to return it but they're in the middle of some research program or project um so i do worry about that is opi providing that kind of equipment to schools as well Well, I was just in conversation with our public school district and, and they ordered 270 hotspots um, that they're going to, they don't quite have a deployment plan yet, but I was trying to coordinate with them and I was like, oh, so my three, <laughs> you don't, we don't need to, to worry about those so much. So I think it depends on the school district, what they're doing. I think that's right, Susie. OPI is not coordinating anything. Yeah, as far as I know, there there hasn't been anything from OPI. Um, I know in our district, we're, we're now officially going to be one-to-one, -one, finally. Um, but I don't know that they have any plans for hotspots. Um, and that would be something that I guess I haven't thought to ask, but I should. <laughs> so, so Kate. You mean one to one every student has a device? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that will be um, something that all of our students will now finally have and they'll be responsible for their device um, to, to carry to and from school every day. And that will be, I think, second through 12th. I don't think they're doing that for the, the little ones, but which is a change. We have never had that before. It, it, it seems like a harbinger. It seems like that's, that's, you know, it's like the leaves start turning kind of brown, you say falls on the way. This, that feels like some sort of a sign. And I, I get, I take hope from that. That sounds good to me. Yeah, I think it's definitely a good change. And I think um, it, it's necessary. And they, they understand that <clears throat> at any given point, we could get the 
a sign that we will close down and be only online. And so that's their solution to making sure that students don't have to do the scramble like we did last spring to get their, you know, get a device in their hands. Um, so I, I'm, I'm also pleased that that was kind of a non-negotiable in their technology plan for sure. So, so you, the students can make a really clean pivot if all of a sudden you have to lock mm -hmm. them. You know, right. But what does that mean to Lewis and Clark Library, to be specific, that that every student in the from the district has got a device? I mean, that strikes me that that that's a valuable clue, as they would say in Nancy Drew, um, about um, what's coming down the road. I think it is a clue, Bruce. Uh, a good friend of mine works for the Great Falls Public Schools, and she's talked, though, about something that's much harder to solve, and that is the fact that not all students have a really great environment for learning and using those devices, and those students are being left farther and farther behind as things are shifting to an online virtual world. I'm sure that that's true, but but in in part of me says let's let's help those students, right? Or let's let's help school libraries help those students. But the other thing I I hear is low hanging fruit. Let's not do nothing just because we can't do everything. That's a good point. And Stacy uh, pointed out that the goal for us should be to project a positive attitude during this time of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a little side tidbit. We've been interviewing candidates for a position here, and one person works at a newspaper in Arkansas, and um, they are giving away iPads to some of their older readers. And this woman's job was to go to their houses and, and set them up with their iPads and then show them how to access the newspaper. And I just, I was like, are most newspapers doing this? And she's like, I don't know. But I just thought that is possibly something that, you know, we could maybe do is go out to people's homes and help them set up. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but um, it was just a, a pretty amazing project that they had going on, I thought. Um, Worthington, Ohio, um, it was, no, I'm sorry, it was Columbus, Ohio, uh, said that the goal, one of their public library goals was going to be to raise um, a kid's readiness to enter kindergarten or first grade. And um, they basically would use the, the uh, school districts metrics to see to what effect if they were having any effect upon that and they committed to sending librarians out to people's homes to kind of mimic what you're talking about kit to to help kids so so you know if that's what it took that that's what they were going to do uh, make a house call to help uh, raise kids uh, readiness to read and all the other measures that the the, the, the school district was using uh, to, to enter kids and, and I've always been struck by two things with that. One is that the public library used someone else's metrics to judge their success because it was a great metric and it did adequately judge their success. And two, they were willing to leave the library building and personally make house calls to help, help kids along. And I just thought, what a great model. Expensive, uh, a, change, a change in the way we think about how we deliver service, but you know, um, it, it was direct and it, 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 it perfectly addressed the problem. I wanted to go back to something that Kate mentioned earlier about librarians supporting individual teachers and their and their curriculum work. I'd like to know more information about that. It sounds almost like a kind of an embedded librarian role. Do I have that right? Um, yeah, for sure. I think that at the high school level, especially, and um, and quite a bit at the middle school level, a large portion of what we do is just collaborating with teachers on individual um, lessons or units that they're working on. Um, <clears throat> and so that 
obviously is changes from year to year, it changes from quarter to quarter, it changes depending on our staff. Um, so we, it, it's sort of a hard thing to anticipate, but it's something that we have to actively promote so that mm. we're being used um, by our teachers in the way that we would like to be used. I think it's a little bit different at the elementaries because they're on a fixed schedule. So they are, um, they're part of the student's schedule and provide that, um, that prep time for the teachers. And I know that they work collaboratively too, um, but they, they have their own curriculum that they're, they're scheduled to teach. So at the high school, we are in and out depending on what the teachers see as a need. And that could vary from a, um, you know, independent read um, lesson to research to digital literacy to, you know, whatever they're working on, close reading, whatever they're doing, they might bring us in for um, one period or they might bring us in for uh, several weeks at a time um, as, as needed. How do you see the start of the school year changing that role? Or do you, do you think the need will increase? Uh, I, I anticipate that our greatest, the greatest need from our teachers at the beginning will be technology support. And um, I think that they will probably need us not only for what their students need, but what they need. And I think Mm -hmm. uh, there will be some learning for, uh, for us, just trying to figure out exactly what they are going to need. We're trying to anticipate some of that um, and trying to figure out how we can provide that information, whether or not we're in their classrooms or whether or not they're able to come to us. So we've talked a lot about uh, video tutorials and, and things like that and sort of building a library for different things that we anticipate that they will need. Um, I th which is a little bit different than normal. Normally we would have in our school, we would have all of the freshmen come in to the library and we'd do an orientation and we'd kind of get them um, used to our services and our expectations. I don't expect that we will probably do that, but I think that our orientation will probably be some, some other format, I think. Maybe it will be a video tutorial. Of, this is how you can place a hold on a book or this is how you access our databases or um, those kinds of things. I think that, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to sort of uh, embed that into some of the classes that we work with. And, you know, maybe at the freshman level, we are in all the English classes or, or something. I don't know yet. I, it, 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 we have to sort of convince the teachers that that is valuable time. Um, yeah. And this year of all years, they, they, they may not have their students face to face for very long mm -hmm. or if at all. So that will be a challenge. One of the reasons I ask and kind of think a little bit about this idea of librarians as trusted professionals and, and information literacy experts. I know I've been so impressed with Susie's work as embedding herself as the librarian in uh, the, the local government proceedings there in Great Falls. I, I, I think that that's a normal, natural, uh, I would say almost expected role for librarians, but I don't know how much we take advantage of those kinds of opportunities. The same is very true for school libraries. Uh, and I think, you know, not only are we doing our jobs and making sure that uh, whether it's in education or in government services, people have access to the information they need to be effective, uh, it, it elevates the role of librarians and it creates those relationships that are necessary to build trust, uh, to be that trusted voice. Uh, and I know we don't have the capacity to embed ourselves in all of the different kinds of groups and organizations where we might want to do so. But I, I think maybe, maybe this is naive, but maybe part of the answer is seeking out those key groups 
in our communities and showing up, embedding ourselves, putting ourselves out there, um, doing our jobs as information professionals to get them information they need, and and in turn building, the, hopefully building those relationships as trusted professionals, and and that that would carry forward in, in our work with other groups. That that deafening silence. Uh, I don't want to necessarily cut off this conversation. It is eleven. We've been on online for a couple of hours now. Um, it might be time for a short ten-minute break, and we can come back. And if there's any additional thoughts that you've had while we've, while we've uh, taken a break, we can return to them. And if not, we'll move on to the next topic on the agenda, considering. Uh, library services in both analog and digital form. I thought we would come back at maybe 10 after 11 and then just for your planning plan to break for lunch around 12 15 or 12 30. We'll break for lunch for a half an hour and then uh, after lunch come back and pick up the agenda where we left it off. Does that sound all right to everyone? We'll come back at 11 10. All right. All right, before we move on, I wanted to ask if anybody had any last minute thoughts, questions, uh, or if anybody has any additional questions. Tracy and Kara, if you had anything you wanted to follow up on. I wanted to point out Jennifer's comment in the chat about Schoolhouse Rock and how it was an innovative way to teach basic skills to kids. And she was wondering if there could be a creative way to teach basically information literacy skills to the Montana community. And she also agreed with Stacy that we want to focus on the positive. And I would just say for the group, I've been trying to take notes and put them in the different parts of the agenda so that I could capture your ideas. And I did capture that one, Jennifer. Thanks, Tracy. I just think that in the conversation where Pamela was talking about how I think everyone engaged from academic to school to public, this is a way that we maybe could do that and work together to come up with some, I don't know, games or songs or something that would help people find the information they need when they need it the most and the accurate information they need. Um, I just think there's a real opportunity. We have so much technology available to us that I don't know that we're, imp that we're using it in the ways that, um, serve our patrons best and I think we maybe need to think about how we do that better. I think that's a great point and I I think that's a lot of what Stacy means is just like libraries have been a force for good for a long time and we need to continue that. It's just how because these are challenging times. I guess one final question I would have is uh, whether or not you changed or enhanced or added any services during the pandemic that you see continuing after the pandemic. Well, 
Well, I know we will continue curb service after the pandemic, um, after the library is reopened, because we've had such positive comments from the public who um, are handicapped or um, just need a book, but need it quickly. They don't mm -hmm. have time to run in and, and um, maneuver the library to find it and really like the service. So um, it will be a, a, one of the services that we know we will continue. And us too, we're actually putting in a drive-through. The contract's almost completed and we're gonna have a drive-through put in in, our, in the back of the library. And so hopefully that'll help us be able to continue to do curbside. I know it will be really popular in the winter for our older population. I love that so much. <laughs> Mitch also said in the chat that he's going to continue curbside. Uh, Stacy posted that Sonia is going to continue children's programming at the park. I think that's fantastic. Jody says virtual story hour. The next topic for discussion on your agenda, it, it's a little bit uh, in the realm of thinking about our, our current services in different ways um, and and possibly some low hanging fruit. fruit. And actually the, the, the next topic below that, the, the idea of virtual librarianship, uh, these two conversations really sort of go hand in hand. Um, we've We've been looking about, looking at, and talking about a, a, a list, and it's certainly not an exhaustive list of what we would consider sort of those traditional library services, programming opportunities, collection development work, community outreach, reference, support for technology, interlibrary loan and resource sharing, uh, and and. The question that we've been asking ourselves is what, what, if any, is the digital equivalent to some of these more analog services? And if we view these digital services as sort of a, a virtual librarianship, what do we need to do at the state library and with the library association and other partners to help support all types of libraries to offer sort of virtual librarianship? I, I hesitate. I hesitate even making that distinction um, because I think we. I think and hope that we can view. Uh, either digital alternatives or digital extensions to our services as just a, a normal course of our business. Um, but we know that as we faced the pandemic, uh, we had to ramp up on some of our specific online and, and digital services in order to make sure that we were offering them effectively. And in some cases, we may not be offering them as effectively as we can right now. I'd like to have a conversation about uh, how we can better marry uh, the idea of digital services in the, in the world where we might be more comfortable with analog offerings, um, the, the virtual programming discussion that we had prior and, and how we measure engagement and whether or not that programming is meeting community needs, how we think about that. And, and to me, the, the, the lens to, to look at that question, you know, programming, collection development, et cetera, are tools. What do we want to build with the tools? What we want to build with the tools are uh, we, we want to take and, and, and address, uh, satisfy 
our users' needs. So Susie has wants easy access to you know, physical library materials, so she builds a, a drive-in window. How cool is that? But, but I, think the, I think that these things are maybe, for me at least, best understood by looking at what patrons need and then, and then, and then moving to the tools that we use to take and, and deliver those, be they, as you say, um, uh, Jenny, uh, digital or analog. I, I really been thinking about this a lot, um, and you know we are we are doing a lot of online story time stuff, um, and and what we have actually found to be the most helpful is is stuff that builds community. So we've been partnering with a local American Sign Language group, and they are doing some interpreting, and it's a way to connect them, um, and and so those programs where we're building on a community group seem to be fairly successful programs where we're just doing story time. I mean, how do you compete with LeVar Burton? You know, I mean, there's, there's so many wonderful things online um, that I, you know, if all, if all we're doing is reading a story online, um, like, there's tons of other people doing that. So in, in our minds, we've been trying to really look at the virtual programming, not just as, um, uh, you know, doing the thing, but, but what, what sort of community is it building? Um, because, because there's tons of stuff out there and, and we are not as good as a lot of other bigger players. Susie, I agree with you, but what we've found from our users is that their children connect to our staff. So when they see our staff doing mm -hmm. Braden playing the guitar and singing with his daughter and getting the kids that are home to do the same thing, um, their kids participate more because they're used to, to those faces and feel comfortable with those faces. So I, I think even though we're not as good as, can't perform as well as, whatever. Um, it's the face-to-face -face contact that people really need. And that's why the discussion, book discussion groups are so successful because those groups of people feel comfortable together. And so they discuss the book, but they also discuss themselves because um, they're comfortable with that group where they wouldn't be with others. So I think we still have that value that the professionals that do those kinds of things don't have. Relationships. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. That's what you've got to focus on. Right. The first time Cindy did her virtual story time, it like blew up. I mean, it was just people were so excited to see Cindy, you know, and I think that was pretty special and it's continuing, so. This is Jennifer and I think that's exactly the kind of thing I was talking about when I was talking about the Schoolhouse Rock. It, it's something that you, you, the, if we did this as a whole group down, um, working together that would meet our communities and kind of reach out to them in a way that um, they can connect with us, with librarians that they know and trust, communities, but also maybe with each other. And those are those are the things that are whirling around in my head. And I'll leave it at that. What about collection development? seems like one that would be a little bit more in our wheelhouse. We've had Montana Library to go for well over a decade now and other kinds of digital content. Um, do you think we've hit on the, uh, the, the right balance, the right approach, understanding that we don't have enough digital content, but do you, do you think um, libraries have embraced the need for digital content and uh, are, are 
viewing digital resources as an effective part of their collection development? I think so. Um, you know, there's just never enough money. It's if we can figure out a way to buy more content, um, there'd be a lot more happy people. But it's there to offer um, and it gets well used. So we know how much use the Montana Library to Go gets. So therefore, um, we know it's very successful. I, I'm wondering how other public libraries are handling um, physical collection development. Are you, you know, putting less into that so you can put more into e-resources? Um, I, I, because I'm, I'm anticipating this year is going to be you know a lot lower checkout of physical items it has been since even we opened up so i just wonder if i mean, I mean we're going through this right now should we kind of you know rearrange a little bit with our budget um i know it's scary to think about you know not ordering as many physical items but um i just don't know the use this year Susie and <laughs> Well, it's really hard to um, make that decision because we don't know what's going to happen with the public in the next few months. But looking back at what we circulated last year, um, that's where we make our projections for the following year. So you know, we just take a percentage of what was spent um, on where the percentage lies between materials that are print and materials that are digital and split our budget accordingly. And all we can do is go on the past, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as we would love to make everyone love digital, it's just not there. Mm -hmm. yeah. We still have a large population of people who read print materials. So Hanor, I want to just make sure I understand you, you, you view your budget as a materials budget and uh, you're, you're dividing uh, the allocation for procurement yep. based on use, not yep. this is my print budget and this is my, my, digital budget. So we have a print budget based on what percentage of things that were checked out in the past year were print and what percentage were digital. And that's how we figure the budget. By the amount of money we have divided by those percentages. Yep. Is that pretty typical for most libraries? That's real similar to what we do. Um, we do fudget a little bit because, you know, like easy readers check out like gangbusters versus oh, yeah. the nonfiction, but they're also, you know, so much cheaper. <laughs> I yeah. mean, we, we, we cannot buy. <laughs> so we, we fudge that a little bit, but we do try to have um, the percentages go toward the checkouts. Um, and, and we just kind of consider it all our materials budget. Um, so we, we do the same sort of thing. We've been having trouble getting stuff in, like um, we had, a, I think our warehouse was shut down for a little while. So we had a couple of weeks where we weren't really getting much stuff, but, um, and we did uh, allocate more money to Montana Library to go when we closed, um, but we're kind of back just to normal. And and I'm I, I'm just really curious I mean, I think we're going to just have to like throw this year out in terms of statistics and then um, and then just carry on, which is fabulous for people who are new directors, because if anything doesn't go well, I just say I just blame it on COVID. <laughs> Everybody can blame it on COVID, Susie. Mm -hmm. It's been a normal year anywhere and 
it's really difficult to try to um, anticipate that, but it's also difficult because our budgets didn't grow because of COVID. Um, you know, we're all looking at spending in Missoula County, we're all looking at our budgets remaining the same as they were last year um, because COVID has grown such a hardball into the the whole system. And so um, all we can do is a try over. Mm -hmm. However, we were um, like we're following Lewis and Clark County or Lewis and Clark Library in that we are adding Access 360 to our collection because our foundation um, gave us money to purchase our opening day collection. And our opening day collection was $400,000 of which we put 200,000 towards print material and 200,000 towards um, Access 360. So um, our patrons will have access to more um, digital collection because of that. Um, and we'll see how that goes. And it's going to be, uh, you know, something that selectors are watching very carefully because now they're going to have, we'll split our budgets between Montana Library to Go, print materials and Access 360. So it'll be interesting to see how all that goes, but we're up for the challenge. It's a good time something different. What about some of the smaller libraries? Stacey, I see your chat. Are you referring to how you allocate your budgets for digital and print materials? I think Stacy might have been responding to Kara's comment. You know, Kara mentioned that her kids. <clears throat> love Montana Library to go, but they are experiencing digital burnout mm -hmm. and appreciate having access to print. And I think Stacy was saying Miles City and Fallon County are seeing that in their patrons as well. And with schools thinking about a hybrid of online and not, or, you know, at home also, I think we're going to see more of that, more families that are going to want to be able to take out print materials because um, their kids are spending so much online, it's frustrating to them. Mm -hmm. Stacy points out they also have the challenge of internet issues. That's a very important consideration. Let's talk about outreach and community engagement. We've talked a little bit about this in terms of our programming and relationship building, the idea of embedded librarianships. Um, in, in some ways, it's more challenging not to be able to be face to face with people. Um, in other ways, perhaps being able to attend meetings and events online creates more opportunities for different kinds of outreach. Uh, and again, wondering what your, your perspectives are about um, doing that work face to face and opportunities or more uh, online or, or digital engagement? Well, we've decided that um, we're very lucky because um, Missoula, to, Missoula Community Access Television is joining us in the new library. And so mm -hmm. all of our programming from now on, um, we're gonna have to limit the amount of people that attend the programs 
So we will do um, the program with streaming from Missoula Access TV um, so people can watch it at home and participate um, at the same time. So it's going to be a new experience. Um, we just got used to Zoom and now we're going to pursue <laughs> different uh, platform. Um, what, what I have noticed from having our board meetings online is we finally have some people that are participating in our board meetings. They never come to an in-person meeting, but they have come to online meetings. So our library board meetings will continue to be the same. We will do them through Zoom in person and um, hopefully continue to have some community participation instead of just library board members and myself. So I think it's, um, it's made us stretch a little bit, but for the good. Um, for, for us, we have actually been down a lot of staff um, because of childcare issues and, and vulnerable populations. And so um, we have had to cut a lot of, I mean, you can't do everything you were doing plus quarantining the books and plus doing all the other things. And so um, we are actually not doing very much adult programming at all. And I don't feel great about it, but um, that's the reality of where we are right now. And hopefully when we get back to more fully staffed, we'll be able to do more, but that's where we are. Are there, are there groups, this, this might not be a great time to ask this question given the pandemic, but are there, um, other groups or, or organizations outside the library that you might be engaging with online that you maybe didn't prior to the pandemic or see an opportunity to engage with now using different kinds of technology because they are uh, doing more online? Jenny, I think that that's a really good possibility for the future. Mm -hmm. um, for us right now, for the last four months, we've just been scrambling to keep our heads above water. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now that we kind of have a handle on how things are going, mm -hmm. school decides to um, go two days a week. And so now kids are home three days a week. And like Susie, we need to um, provide for those staff members to be able to work from home mm -hmm. as they have to um, have, provide childcare and be teachers and still work. So it really, um, it makes it really difficult, but I think now that people are more used to doing kind of online things, that it will be easier to make those connections, I guess, and with less staff. Yeah. Have any of you supported other organizations who've been trying to uh, provide online engagement and turning to the library for help with the technology or other kinds of information resources. We've helped the fire department take online tests. <laughs> so, how much we've done. <laughs>
I think that's a great idea. We just haven't, you know, just trying to tread water. Those are not things that we've been able to do. I would love to do that, though. I think partnering with other people for online stuff would be great. I wanted to call out a, a discussion that's going on in the chat uh, that Bruce raised about the depth of collection development for our digital collections. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I guess my question is, what is the barrier that's preventing that depth of collection in our digital resources? You know, how and, you know, if if we were talking about the analog equivalent, what would the response be? It's money and the licensing. The licensing. It makes, you know, a, you buy a print copy of something, you can circulate it till it falls apart. Yep. And that's not the case with digital. And so it makes it really expensive. I also think that if we did a better job of letting the public, helping the public understand why we have less digital copies of things, that um, they'd be willing to pay a dollar when they check something out. But we've just never done a very good job of getting that word out to people. Um, you know, it's for people who read digital, if they have to buy a copy from someplace else, it costs them a lot of money. If they check out from the library and just gave a small donation, it would increase the budget for purchasing those items. Mitch is asking about loaning out Zoom. Uh, Mitch, what we've done is have our staff participate in and kind of host meetings rather than a, as a way to make the, the resource available. We don't, we don't give out our logins or anything like that. What about reference services? We had the virtual chat years and years ago that didn't really take off and, and ultimately we decided not to continue. Um, obviously there's email. Are libraries using chat or other forms of digital reference services? Digital reference was really popular, has been really popular. Um, and for our new website, we're adding, I don't know what the name of the, the program is, that will be a live chat um, with a reference librarian. But it's a perfect thing for people that need to work from home because it gives them the opportunity to be able to continue to work and be productive um, in their job while others are on site doing the on site work. So. It's been really great for us. Um, our reference people have continued to answer many, many questions um, during the pandemic from outside the library walls. Mm -hmm. Nancy says yes, both email and chat. We, we had asked the librarian email source um we only had one person doing it during our shutdown and that seemed to be enough but as soon as we got back in the library we started um pushing out a phone number for people to call and it's pretty crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. lots, of people calling, lots of people needing help with certain things or mostly wanting to know our hours because they're crazy but um i think 
that a chat um, we've been kind of thinking about that if if some if that's something the state wanted to help out with I think actually that would help a lot of libraries and Jenny I think when we had it before it was before the time yeah. um, it was cutting edge so so to speak but it wasn't a great product mm -hmm. what was out there and people weren't used to chatting now people are used to chatting for everything so i think it will get a lot more use now that's a great point and historically montana has had um has has performed less reference services for our users than do many other states we're just typically we don't report as high numbers as as do others and so that's either montanans have all the answers uh, mm -hmm. or we do a poor job marketing uh, those skills. I suspect, of course, it's the latter. The law library uses, I mean, our reference um, service is heavily used. In fact, Christine, we have to tell people that they might have to wait for a couple weeks to hear back since it requires a little, you know, some research and there's uh, such a high number. Um, so that we don't give the phone number because she would just be inundated. Um, it's all by email or they can leave a message with us, but then she can call them back or send stuff by email or um, by regular mail at no charge. Um, but a couple things that are newer, um, the self-help um, law program, which you're probably familiar with, or the court help program has a newer um, project where they installed um, the remote centers, many in um, public libraries, in fact, um, where they can call in and do um, a Skype meeting with the Helena Self-Help Law Center. So those are at really outlying areas that um, it would be too much to ask for them to, you know, drive over to Great Falls or wherever to, um, to go to a self-help center in person, but it, it's a lot it's nice because then they can upload the documents and have the staff person review them and everything like that. So that's worked out well and it's been a nice um, collaboration with, uh, with public libraries. And then one other thing that we're just starting to experiment with is like a chat bot. Um, we've, we haven't used a live chat, but um, one area of question that we get quite a bit is on probate matters. So, um, staff built a little um, bot to help, you know, prompt the questions and let the person know probably like it seems like they may have this type of, of probate going on and here are the resources you can use. And again, that's just to streamline so they don't wait for two weeks to hear back from Christine with the same information. Maybe they can get it sooner. So there's a couple of new things that we're using. What about how we're supporting technology needs? Computer use, Wi-Fi use, maybe even some, well, we've talked about information literacy, uh, training opportunities, other kinds of computer support. Well, our Wi-Fi usage is really big. Even when we were closed, we had, um, we pushed our Wi-Fi out and we had um, over that six weeks, over 2000 people use our Wi-Fi. Um, and, um, but it is also um, an issue. I mean, we have people in our neighborhood that want us to turn our Wi-Fi off whenever we're closed because we do have a lot of people that come and hang out and, um, so we have this ongoing push pull with our neighbors and right now we have it on from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, but Wi-Fi usage is, is huge both when we're open and when we're closed. I 
I imagine that's the same for most communities. Yeah, and for us, it was not our neighbors that were um, upset about it. It was the police department mm -hmm. because um, there were so many people hanging around the library and sleeping at the library causing issues because we weren't opened and we still had our Wi-Fi on. So we had to limit the hours that it was on um, in order to kind of make peace with the police department. So um, Wi-Fi is huge. I mean, in our Condon library, um, the truckers go down the highway, pull into the parking lot at Condon and use that Wi-Fi because it's on 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And one of the only places they can get Wi-Fi along that highway. So um, bikers the same way, it's, it's hugely used for such a tiny little space. Um, good thing they have a great big parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's that way in any of our branches where we can actually leave the Wi-Fi on. The branches that are in um, some of the high schools, they don't want Wi-Fi on after, after a certain hour. So that limits it a little bit, but Wi-Fi is a big deal. Nancy's pointed out in the chat that um, they've continued to allow patrons to use their computers. It was by appointment only. I think that speaks to the need for the devices as well as the internet access. So from the um academic library point of view or perspective, we of course are, are looking at um, our e-resource collection trails wide. Um, and I, I haven't heard back from all the directors yet, but I know darn well that budget cuts are coming. Um, so we'll be looking at probably cutting, but something that has been brought up um, is the fact that a number of our members um, don't have a proxy or um, don't have authentication um, at all, perhaps. So if we're looking to move everything online or a lot of things online, they're not gonna be ready for that, but that's an individual call by campus, of course, as to whether they feel like their students would, would take advantage of it, or even if they would take advantage of it, does the community um, have the bandwidth they have can they even connect they have a smartphone what do they have so um that's a new issue that i think we're going to be bringing up for discussion that's what one thing that's really interesting to me is we used to worry about people not having access to computers or a way to get on the internet that doesn't seem to be the problem today. Everybody has a smartphone, even our homeless population have smartphones. It's um, being able to get internet connectivity. That's the difficult thing. And when we were doing our campaign for a new library, um, you know, we found out that 45% of the people who live in Missoula County do not have internet access and some of them can't get it. They don't have any kind of an option in their communities to have internet access. So that still remains, the connectivity piece still remains um, unbelievable to me in Montana because we've worked on it for years and we've never really reached a solution or a company who's willing to go the extra mile, I guess, to um, make that infrastructure possible for people. So you know, that's why these little devices that the State Library bought are so important because even our staff um, 
So we had a few before we got the ones from the state library that we were able to send home with our staff during our closure so that they could do um, work from home. And otherwise they wouldn't have been able to because they live somewhere where they don't have access or they just can't afford to pay for access. So it's really interesting to see how that has evolved through time but the underlying crux of the problem never has been solved. It seems to me there, there is a, a legitimate argument that um, having access to Wi-Fi nowadays is just sort of like having access to electricity and sanitary sewer and, and potable water. Um, that, that is not the, that's not, not the situation uh, when you talk to um, the vendors that are in, in that space. But um, and I understand that the infrastructure is expensive, but we are paying an awful lot of money uh, compared to most of the uh, first nation, you know, first uh, industrialized nations around the world for for uh, in many cases, uh, second or third rate uh, connectivity. And it strikes me that since connectivity is such an important part of our overall strategy as libraries, that that's something we should have an interest in. I'm, I'm not suggesting we should all go out and erect towers, uh, but maybe, I don't know. At the very least, um, we, should, we should take and make it so that our local providers um, have to have to make sure that everyone who uh, everyone ha has access and that's not the situation now i agree 45 is a large percentage uh Honor. i'm surprised but i'm sure that's true yeah um what surprises me bruce is after living through this pandemic that the government that holds the purse strings doesn't see that that's an issue for families i mean Education is having to happen over the internet. Medical calls now are being taken over the internet. Doctors, if you have an appointment at um, St. Pat's Hospital, they call you and ask, do you have to come in or can we do it telecommunication? We'd rather have a telecall rather than people in person. Uh, our society is changing and the people who have the money at the top need to be looking at providing that infrastructure for communities. It's, and especially in the West, you know, it's, it's really sad that um, they don't listen to what their con constituents are, are telling them. So I thought it was such a harbinger that the uh, Helena schools are going one-to-one -one with devices to students. So that's really kind of changing the environment uh, for, for us in Helena. Um, because there's a, a this this huge group of people who could, um, if we had more a, a deeper collection of digital materials, for instance, both fiction and nonfiction, they could avail themselves of it. And that wasn't true five years ago or maybe ten years ago, but we're still prevented from from um, uh, pursuing that strategy because there's not enough connectivity, and that's that's a pity. I participated in a legislative hearing last month uh, from a legislative interim committee and they were looking at broadband. I was providing public comment and along with uh, another person and I testified and then the other person testified and he told me later that he got a text from one of the legislators while he was testifying saying, hurry up, we're bored. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? They said, what? oh my God, okay. Um, I gotta actually ask this group a question because I gotta reveal my ignorance about this, but I, I need like a Reader's Digest version or something of what is going on with the broadband. I mean, um, Honor said something about companies aren't willing to come in and make the investment in the infrastructure, et cetera, but is it, would you mind sharing with me like, 
<laughs> when I'm supposed to know already, but I don't? Like, what is what is going on with that? Probably more political than financial. I remember attending a meeting in 2008 or 2009 with then Governor Schweitzer, where he sat down leaders from the different educational offices and he said, I hear we need to do online learning. Do we have adequate broadband to do that? And the person from Ochi said, yep, we're ready. The governor said, great. And he ended the meeting and that was it. And then in 2009 or 10, when we were applying for our broadband technology opportunity program grant, we had intended to apply for funds to do last mile deployment to a lot of libraries and we were going to partner with telecommunication providers in different communities to provide the connectivity. And at the time, the state was renegotiating its uh, state network contract and was uh, going to go with CenturyLink or, or whatever CenturyLink's predecessor was. The telecommunication providers sent a letter to the governor expressing their concern, the, the local telecommunication providers expressing their concern about the state going with a, a national vendor. And the governor contacted us and, and told us that we could no longer apply for the BTOP funds for last mile deployment because he was angry with the telecommunication providers. So that was a, a major opportunity that prevented us from being able to use federal dollars to do that kind of deployment. Uh, and then a lot of the other issues just surround the, the very heavy lobbying that goes on from the Montana Telecommunications Association they're very concerned with any kind of mandate that might come from the state about meeting certain broadband standards or providing different broadband um, re requirements, because especially in rural areas, as Bruce said, deployment is very expensive and the, the customer base is so small, they're concerned about recouping their costs. Uh, there are federal dollars available to help off help offset some of those dollars, but there's so many federal hoops and regulations that uh, make some of that very prohibitive. And what I've seen over the years is just a, a lack of political will for our leaders to step forward and say, this is no longer acceptable. We're going to look at different kinds of models, be it legislation, be it authority to address the concerns. Certainly, nobody's been willing to invest financially at the state level in broadband. Very disheartening. It really is because we've spent hours attending meetings in communities to provide broadband for the community and it's never happened. When, you know, for BTOP, we got our bus and we still could not bring broad or bring internet access to some communities because there was no way we could get it. Stacy mentioned the USDA broadband program and um, we, Montana looked into that, but one of the requirements is that we have to have a state broadband plan and there's no leadership at the state level to create the state broadband plan. Um, two more questions. So who is there like, who's the tech guru or the department of whatever, who's the person in charge of technology, basically, infrastructure? Well, it depends on, there, there's no coordinated effort um, so we do what we can for libraries. The state uh, information technology services division is only focused on state government services. Uh, there is mm -hmm. no one for education. So. Um, 
Yeah, Suzanne, Suzanne posted in the chat that I'm a state broadband contact. I, I've actually been referred to as that person from the governor's office. <laughs> <laughs> that nasty woman from, sorry. Um, okay, yeah, great. Um, wow. So it looks like, yeah, Stacy Moore is suggesting that we that find somebody to work on this. It seems like a great, a great idea. And, and again, excuse my ignorance, but um, to understand this, would, would satellite allow broadband access or is there still, there's still a physical infrastructure that needs to be in place in order to use that? Satellite is a, a partial solution. Okay. There's I thought, a lot of low, low orbit satellite being kind of put in, into space right. and that would take care of some of the latency problems. But um, my understanding, and, and um, I think that uh, Jenny knows the answer to this and, and Suzanne, that we, we have, we have at least as far as communities go, we have fiber pretty much everywhere, but it doesn't make it to, to people's homes and to libraries and to um, businesses. So it's that last little bit that is, is lacking. Is that true? I don't, I don't think it's entirely true. The telecommunication providers have been reluctant to say where there's fiber. Would this be something we could ask the PSC to work on? <laughs> no. Well, it, it, they've been asked this is over and over and have always refused. They don't, they don't have the, the legislative authority. It seems to me that this is also an economic development issue because exactly. as people are going yep. online and they can work remotely, people want to work remotely. I mean, I have a family member who is staying in yeah. California, but they're renting an apartment in Great Falls so that their kid can go to school here and they're going <laughs> to just telecommute um, for the semester. And I, I feel like if we want high paying jobs to come into Montana, this is a no brainer. Um, but I guess then again, we can all say this is a great idea, but how do we operationalize this? Like what is, so what is the, our action steps? We actually just found out yesterday that the Montana Economic Development Association has created a committee that is looking at broadband. I think you're exactly right, Susie. Okay. They're, a, they're a great stakeholder group that I hope can be a real champion. Um, so we're gonna be meeting with them next week to find out what their interests are um, and maybe through some lobbying efforts there, we can get some state leadership to start paying attention to this. I, I have a family member who lives in Kalispell making Seattle wages. I mean, what a great deal, huh? huh. Um, Jenny, the economic development group in Missoula, I know a few years ago was, you know, trying to get something broadband going because we were working with Ken Wall. Right. And, um, it, it, there, it always gets so far and then it just, the money just is never there to get it going. So hopefully if they do it at a state level, it would happen. Yeah. There's some fantastic models in other states. If, if the state would just um, take the initiative. And it took and me a I'll, while to I'll get just plugged tell you in. The, the great thing for us was um, Blackfoot Telephone for part of their donation to the public library. It's free internet access for the library for 10 years. And for wow. teachers who are in the building, in that you know, free Wi-Fi access to the public that we don't have to pay for because um, Blackfoot's giving to giving it to us. If more groups like that could provide that service to the libraries, it helps mm -hmm. libraries be able to shift their money digitally or to something else that they don't have to use um, that they're paying for their internet access. And all those little co-ops 
seem to be the ones that are willing to do that kind of thing. Okay, um, I, it took me a while to get my headset plugged in again to join you, but um, I just wanted to kick in a little bit. I think, I think some of you are really hitting on, I think some of our greatest potential is doing this locally, really, since we don't have the state infrastructure for it. Um, and, you know, one of the models that's been successful other places is, you know, municipal broadband that I know um, I've heard Missoula and Bozeman talking about in some ways of kind of taking it on themselves. Um, but yes, a lot of the, um, the co-ops are the ones who have been doing the best job with this, in my opinion. And there is a lot of fiber out there, um, thanks to the co-ops. And so in a lot of instances, our rural communities are actually in better shape than some of our urban communities, because depending on who your provider is, but um, it's it's an ongoing challenge in this state. It really is. I've been working on this for years. And um, just as we think, you know, we've got something like BTOP, you know, the rug gets pulled out from under us. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, if you guys have great ideas and great contacts, we'd love to hear them. Mm -hmm. Well, is it is it partially a matter of like needing well, you need, it's money, of course, it's always money, but I mean, do you need juju? I, if, if you had, like you said, the, the, that the labor department, that sounds great. That sounds really promising. If you've got the, that academic or educational community in and the business community and we're, and we're all putting pressure on, we're saying we need this yesterday because they will, especially if they're going to be flipping to online. And I don't see that they're not going to be <laughs> for a while. I don't, I mean, that, would that help? I don't know. It would help, Pamela, absolutely. I think we need to have some concrete ideas about what we're asking for. Um, okay. When I was testifying last month, I was suggesting that they pass a study bill this next legislative session that through the study could come up with a state broadband plan that would address questions of authority and funding. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that I find most disheartening about this is there is funding out there. The USDA funds, for example, mm -hmm. that Stacy talked about. Um, there's E-rate dollars. There's other kinds of federal investment. There's um, other kinds of universal service funds like E-rate. I worry as a state, we're leaving significant amounts of money on the table because we don't have any kind of coordinated approach. Ready to go. It's really like a, it's a patchwork quilt of opportunity that could be brought to, to bear if we had some focused time and attention and authority to, to solve the problems. Um, as Suzanne said, really, I agree right now that the primary opportunities are local, compel, we have that kind of statewide approach. Mm -hmm. And I, I think to try to get something done in this legislative environment often takes an interim study to, to really look at the issues and to try to bring some legislation forward. So I, I, I want to try to return to our list um, I know there have been lots of questions about interlibrary loan and physical resource sharing, and, and um, we'll talk a little bit later in the agenda about the courier program itself, but um, we wanted to know specifically about concerns that libraries might have um, and whether or not the study, the realm study that's looking at the different kinds of materials might help with some of those kinds of concerns. Kara, jump in if there's any other specific information you're looking to discuss.
Well, I can. I guess. Go ahead. I'll just be short. I can say quarantining has been um, a real struggle for us, and we don't know how to think about it going forward either. I just don't think it's ever going to end. So this, the structure here and the process here is hard enough. Um, I mean, we are sharing in our sharing group, um, but it's a challenge that I can't figure out right now. And, and we are in our library alone, mean again, too. What were you going to say, Susie? Sorry. Well, I, <laughs> this might not be popular, but I just have real concerns about our quarantining. I, you know, yes, they have found virus. I think the realm study is really helpful, but I would like to know how much of a vector is that really? I mean, we are not washing our doors every time somebody comes in and out. Um, and yet we're investing all this staff time in the quarantining and we bought new shelves and we, you know, have the stuff and then we shift the stuff. And um, I, I think the realm study is great to know that there are virus particles on there, but I would really like to know, like, is that actually a route where transmission happens? Do we really need to be doing this? quarantining our books and I, I was wondering how they would ever verify that somebody contracted the virus from a library book. I don't know enough to say definitively whether somebody could or not. I see my children touching their face all the time after they're handling a book and I think that's probable, but how would they trace that back to the library book. Um, it's, I think it's just more like data for your own risk assessment. And in a sharing group, you have to make that as that decision more, you know. For us, um, we get a lot of really grimy stuff back at time mm -hmm. and um, discard books because of things that are on pages that come from little people's noses. And so we know that that's what you see in a normal time. It makes me happy that we can quarantine because um, whatever we can do to keep the public safer, I believe is our responsibility. So until somebody can prove to me that the materials that we are lending do not cause COVID in a family, then we'll continue to quarantine. Is, is there any definitive scientific study showing books are a problem, books aren't a problem? No. Oh. Define problem. There's a study that's showing how long the virus is viable on different kinds of material types. <sighs> I think what Kara said is it's about it's about risk assessment. It's about how we apply that information in our libraries. Well, I, th I think we have to follow the science, and and. With lack of science, then sounds like we're back to where we started making making judgments about um, whether we should be um, uh, erring on the side of caution or erring on the side of uh, workflow. I don't have an opinion. I will say that I'm still baking my newspaper every morning. <laughs> Yeah, I know um, we visit periodically with some scientists from the lab in Hamilton and, you know, they are so cautious about their mail at their houses. And I don't even think about our mail, but when I see people who work in that realm being cautious about those kind of things, it makes me think there must be something to it. So keep baking your newspaper, Bruce.
I know, is that the lab that they were kind of one of the first ones to talk about um, the germs on physical items? I, I yeah. Can't it came out. Okay. So how much cleaning then are people doing inside the library? Can you say that again, Susie? How much cleaning are you doing inside the library? Like we're, we're wiping down um, uh, frequently used surfaces, hopefully every hour, probably more realistically every other hour. So right now we don't have anyone in the library except for staff. So, but every time um, staff go in and out the door for curb service, they're wiping the handle as they go out and in. Um, and our health department will come and do a walkthrough of our new library on the 19th of this month, and they will give us guidelines for us to be able to open. So. Um, I'm sure that with those guidelines will come how often we have to wipe things down. Um, we'll probably do much like the hospital does with a card of some kind that when people use the surface, they turn the card over and that system is only as good as the people who are using it. If they don't turn the card over, then you don't know somebody's been there. So, um, but we don't have the staff to be able to follow people around and make sure they are doing what you ask them to do. I'm curious how many libraries represented by this group limit the number of people in their library? We will. We do. And the amount of time they can spend. Yes. Huh. Well, that's our guidelines question. from our health department are we need to limit exposure to our staff and to the people who are using the library. So therefore you have to limit the amount of people that are in the building and the time that they spend in the building. And we'll have to mix the staff as far as you maybe work today and you're off tomorrow and then work the next day. So they have limited exposure. I don't know how that works, how that helps, but they seem to think it does. That is so interesting because we did not get that from our health department at all. Our, our packet got approved and we have nothing like that. Oh, so hard. I know that Imagine If is limiting both um, number of people and the time they spend in there. And they, you know, I know it's, it, it's very hard. It goes against the grain completely for what we believe in, but I also know that that's what you have to do to keep everyone safe. Or that's, that's what we think. That's what I believe. I also think it depends on the size of your community, how many cases you have, all those, those things and, you know, Missoula County has quite a few cases and they're just trying to stay on top of it. And so um, we will be required to hand in a plan before we open the doors to the public and they will accept or reject the plan. So by working with them in the front, we won't have to hopefully close again because somebody has COVID in the library. I guess this also just makes me think about some of the analog stuff that we do that we don't talk about a lot, like the fact that when the library closed and um, so then the Angel Center had to close because there were too many people and then the county had to put up some porta potty because our homeless population didn't have anywhere to use the bathroom and um uh you know nobody had places the homeless population didn't have a place to plug in like to get electricity not just wi-fi but electricity 
And, um, you know, those are all necessities that we don't really think about the fact that, that libraries, well, especially the public libraries um, provide, but I'm, I'm sure the same thing um, on campus. So. But hopefully, Susie, this has made government entities realize where they are lacking in helping people in their communities. Because I know, you know, Missoula tries to reach out to the homeless people through many, many things they do. But they've also found out that they needed to put dumpsters out in locations where homeless people were and things that the homeless didn't have to pay for. So they had to go look for money to be able to do these projects. And they were able to find the money um, through grants and what have you, but they never would have looked at it had this pandemic not happened and forced them to do it. So in a lot of ways, it's helping communities to grow because libraries haven't been able to do it. And they don't even Although know that we, libraries do it. Yeah, although we do get some pushback of that, that we are, uh, I forget the wording, that we're fostering the, the or and enabling and um, the, the homeless population. So, but, but most people are seeing more of what we do. So as we as we think about some of these potential shifts or, or shifts or shifts that we've already been embracing, one of the questions we have is how we think about these kinds of services might be reflected in our public library standards. For example, you know, might we expect to see um, some kind of representation in uh, an expectation that trustee meetings might have an online component, for example, or you know, that there's an, a, an excellent standard might include virtual programming of you know, portion of a budget that's dedicated to online content. That, Not that being from of. a small library at this point in my life, Jenny, and having been there before, I hate to see public library standards connected to things that make small communities unable to provide something else because they have to shift money to buy Zoom or to Oh, I'm digging around and then I'm all dirty from the dust. Or do online programming when they don't have the staff to be able to do it. I, I don't think that that's fair to small libraries. That's just my opinion. Thanks, Nora. Jody says our trustees have had a couple of online meetings due to the virus. Is it possible in regards to standards that what is excellent in one library isn't necessarily excellent in all libraries? I think you're right, Bruce. I think that there's a certain amount of service that everyone needs to provide. And then there are some things that others can provide that others cannot. And it depends on your budget, your staffing, um, your community, and whether your community even would react 
to having an online meeting or whether that would completely turn them off. So I think it, it definitely, the standards are, there's certain standards that need to be there and then there's things that everybody does above what they have to do, but it varies from library to library. But it, it strikes me that the measure of any standard is to the degree it, it, it serves the people that are served by that library. So, so using your example of um, um, having a virtual board meetings, if in a big city or, or in, a, in a hamlet someplace that's served by a public library, if that keeps someone from getting sick because COVID's really active, then obviously that's a valuable service. So that, that's, that's a good thing. You know, I've, I've, I've felt for my entire life that, that interlibrary loan and resource sharing and stuff is good for all kinds of libraries because patrons, regardless of where they live, have wild and wacky uh, needs that, that uh, exceed the, the, the resources of their library. It seems to me that the measure of standards, uh, if we could figure this out, is the degree to which it, it serves the needs of individuals within that community, all the individuals in that community, and then working backwards from that, whether it's worth pursuing because we have limited resources, limited budgets, limited people, and we need to pick and pick and choose about what we pursue, um, which is a long winded way of saying perhaps for some standards, there should be, um, and I'm stealing this idea from, from my friend Jenny Stapp, maybe there should be sort of laddered uh, uh, levels of service or content um, uh, that libraries can identify, you know, what degree is appropriate to them. And when there's need for help uh, for attaining um, uh, a standard, which they don't do at this point, then they turn to the state library or to their colleagues or friends and say, help me. I, I absolutely agree that it depends on what resources and on the community, but I also know that I have used the standards in budget meetings with commissioners to say, you know, well, the public library standard is that we have to be open 50 hours. And if you cut my funding and I can't be open 50 hours, that's actually going to lose us close to $30,000 from the state. And um, so, so saying everybody, you know, according to their resources, I also find part of the value of the standards is being able to turn to my funders and say, you've got to at least fund this. And that, and that makes sense. So maybe there's a balance. A balance between relative and absolute standards or variable and, and absolute standards, or as Mitch said, aspirational standards and basic standards. So maybe there should be, because you're in a, serving a city of a certain size, Susie, maybe there should be a hard and fast basic standard for open hours. But, but maybe there's also for you an aspirational star, standard. Oh, we'd like to be open 80 hours. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. This school district has confirmed At the very least, standards shouldn't prevent a library from doing what it needs to do to meet the use needs of its users, at the very least. Okay, but then we have to prioritize the, the, the needs, like what, what are the the needs because <laughs> um, that's that sounds really cut and dry Bruce but I don't know how cut and dry that is oh I don't think it's cut and dried at all I think it's uh, it, so hard that it might be impossible but I think it's worth considering It's, it's kind of like saying that, that as human beings, we're required to do good. <laughs> what does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and this is a similar kind of thing. The, what anchors me in thinking about this is 
are there individuals or groups of individuals in my community who are somehow missing out on things that the library could be doing for them that would take and, and um, better enable them to be successful human beings? And um, again, acknowledging that can't be done comprehensively, but there, there, there's almost always low hanging fruit, things that can be attacked kind of initially and then work and work from there. And, and I think the standards relate directly to that. The standards shouldn't be about the tools, the procedures, the stuff we have. They should be about the degree to which our users are getting what they need from us. All right, it's just after 1230. I think we could probably use a break. So as I said, let's plan on taking a, a half hour for lunch. So if everybody could be back at 105. Looks like most folks are starting to come back. So the next to topic on the agenda, it, it again, as I said, is related to our previous discussion about uh, how digital offerings might impact some of our more uh, traditionally viewed library services. And one of the questions we've been discussing at the State Library as we think about the kind of the concept of, of virtual librarianship in general is what we can do as a state or the state library to help support librarians in this work. Uh, what kinds of outcomes do we want? What kind of other support needs are necessary? Um, I think a, you know, a couple of good examples that we've already talked about are the shift to online programming and use of various different kinds of platforms that are available to support online programming. Our staff have done a great job of helping to support online board meetings through the use of Zoom. Uh, know that there's need for additional technology and uh, training on how to use those kinds of tools. If we're, if we're thinking about how digital services might continue to uh, augment and in some ways in the future enhance or replace our current traditional library services, we want to be able to make sure that we're positioning libraries to be able to make use of those technologies effectively. We've obviously had to pivot very quickly in some cases during the pandemic. Um, we want to think about how we can be more responsive in the future. So again, I'd like to open it up for discussion and, and get your suggestions and feedback about uh, maybe some pain points that you experience that uh, you wished we'd been able to uh, better prepare for, or as Bruce has said, maybe some low hanging fruit that uh, through resources that we have or, or opportunities that we can create, we can address to better position ourselves to take advantage of these kinds of opportunities both now and in the future.
I think most libraries are comfortable enough in this digital world. Maybe maybe there is uh, fewer needs than we realized. Trial by fire. Yeah, I, I feel like our staff, you know, especially with doing virtual programming, I mean, we just, they just go right in and figured stuff out and, you know, filmed and refilmed and refilmed and now it usually takes less takes and we've figured out what spaces are quiet and um, so, I mean, buying the licenses and doing those sorts of things were just things that we just did. I don't know how difficult that was for the smaller libraries. One of the ideas we've tossed around is the idea of a virtual library boot camp. And we started thinking about what, what kinds of content we would focus on if we if we did that kind of boot camp. And, and Susie, you may be right, it may be something that um, might be intended for uh, either libraries that uh, are smaller, serve fewer populations, uh, maybe um, libraries with smaller staff. Well, Jenny, I hate to say this, but I think maybe we're past that. I think people had to figure it out in the last four months. And yeah. so it's kind of what people need from here forward. Because um, I think everybody, I mean, in communities did what they felt comfortable doing and have that figured out now. So I don't know how we answer that. Do you think there's a need to be concerned that uh, in some of our communities, either due to a lack of resources or um, lack of staff, those needs are just going unmet? Probably this is the wrong group of people to answer that. Um, we would have to reach out to smaller communities in our areas and find out if they have needs or not. I know that we really felt like we didn't hit many of our normal summer reading goals, but that we did the best that we could. Um, so, um, so I, I'm really, I, I don't know what our outcomes were, were, you know, <laughs> measurable. Um, but yeah, summer reading is pretty much over and we did a lot of online stuff. So I, I don't know if some of the smaller libraries might have just continued to do summer reading in person or outside. Uh, Jenny, I'll, I'll just jump in here, and I know there's a, a history um, behind this, but one of the things that I think our schools could really use, again, is access to a, um, a statewide database. And I, I know that there's reasons why that went away. Um, Pamela and I have done some work with trying to explore that possibility again and trying to find kind of our cost-sharing situation for our schools, but when we reached out to the schools, there was overwhelming desire for that. Um, but many of them, since we haven't had it for the last couple of years, have found other options and have 
made room in their budgets as much as they can. So <clears throat> for them to contribute um, to a cost sharing model, they obviously didn't want to pay more than what they currently are paying. Uh, but we're entering into a time where that's one of those resources that I think our, our schools just would really benefit from having available. And I don't know what that would look like or um, if it's even a possibility, but it, I think it's, it's worth me mentioning. Absolutely. There's an overwhelming need for more and more digital resources. Stacy mentioned in the chat, the summer reading program, Read Squared. She had 90 people sign up for it. I know we had a number of libraries make use of it and I hope, I hope libraries will continue to make use of it as we continue through the pandemic. Certainly as a resource that's available beyond summer reading. I'd like to chime in too. I just, I appreciate um, Kate bringing the um, <clears throat> issue up about statewide databases and the need for them in K-12. Um, and yeah, it's been a little, it's been wonderful working with Kate and, um, oh my God, now it's his name. Um, Kate, what was his name? What is his name? He's still around. Uh, Tom. Yeah, how can I forget that? Um, Tom, yeah, but what's his last name? <laughs> I know, <laughs> that's, I think. Yeah, that's the question. So Franta? That sounds yeah. right. Very good. See, COVID brain already. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in, in trying to work with him and, and Kalei too, to some extent, but we just seem to get stymied um, because the vendors do come back to me and go, hey, what's going on with that? Da, 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 da. But I'm like, well, it's kind of stalled out. We're trying to get somewhere with it. But um, honestly, it's OPI <laughs> that really, I think, is the problem. Um, in a large part because they really need to be involved with us. Um, but I just, yeah, I wanted to echo. I didn't want to, uh, Kate, to go, go alone with that comment. So I don't know, I don't know what we can do, but we got to keep working on it. Well, and I know from doing group purchases of databases for this state um, through Missoula Public Library, it is cheaper if somebody takes it on because they only send one bill to you and then you have to try to collect the money from everybody else, which um, sometimes is an issue, but you're doing the work. So it takes the, it makes the price a lot cheaper than if everybody buys them on their own. It's just finding the people that are interested in purchasing databases. That's tough because in the public library, I think most of us find that not very many people use them, um, where school libraries maybe get more use. But, uh, you know, we've kind of gone that round for years with public libraries and trying to get people interested. There just doesn't seem to be the interest for some reason. I would love to have some guidance on how we would prioritize e-resources if we were to receive additional funding at some point and be able to consider what would best fulfill the needs of users and different types of users. There were a few groups earlier this calendar year that were looking at some various resources, uh, language learning apps, uh, uh, LinkedIn learning. We know that these will address different kinds of needs. Of course, the schools need research databases. Uh, I was contacted by someone from the New York Times inquiring whether there was interest in providing that kind of resource through public libraries. And um, it, would, it would be great to offer all of those things. But if we had a limited amount of funding that we could apply towards expanding e-resources, how would we make smart decisions that were um, in the best interest of all different types of libraries. And, you know, it's just all patrons are patrons, regardless of which library they're using in their community. But 
the reason that we discontinued the magazine index stuff was because it wasn't seeing much use from public libraries and it was seeing lots of use from schools and we just made some decisions based upon resources if I recall correctly. I, as long as we still have these sort of weird divisions um, between um, state agencies, the state library and OPI particularly, it seems to me that if, if these magazine indexes are important to schools, that OPI should step up and, and help with the process. I'm not sure that they should do the lifting by themselves, but it strikes me that they have a role to play and um, they probably have the resources to play it. <clears throat> How's that for jumping off the end of the dock? I'm right there with you, Bruce. That's great. <laughs> I think you're 100% correct, Bruce, but we're right back to the same place we were with the shared catalog and trying to get um, OPI to support the schools that are part of the shared catalog. There just doesn't seem to be any interest. Well, I don't think we should give up. No, I don't either. And the frustrating part to me is that, you know, I love the magazine indexes and I really see them as important library resources. The amount of money needed to take and bring unlimited access to a couple major um, offerings to all Montana libraries is still chump change. It's not a lot of money. It's just that um, State Library is a small enough agency that, that it is a lot of money for us. It's, it's just, you know, um, it could happen if we, if we, the collective we, uh, wanted it to happen. But I, I can certainly understand OPI not wanting to tie itself to kind of an ongoing um, cost, even if that cost is relatively modest given their budget. I'm not excusing them. I'm trying to understand them. Well, it's going to end up costing more in the long run because if you're not preparing students in a standard, standardized way across the board, and then they get turned over to higher education, and then our folks look at them and go, how come they don't know how to do X, Y, and Z, then they got to take time. So it's just a never ending kind of cycle. Um, I had another point, but who knows what it was. Well, we were talking earlier, uh, Pam, about information literacy. I, I've, <clears throat> I trained my two girls to routinely you know, look at WorldCat and, and magazine indexes and et cetera, because th those are trusted sources for um, relatively speaking trusted material. I wanted them to know about that and to feel comfortable habitually using them. And it's when we talk about information literacy, we could talk a good line, but back to the show, don't tell. Wouldn't it be a different world if, if students were borrowing uh, materials out of New Zealand? I was thinking about Kara's question about how we would prioritize resources. And the thought that's kind of circulating in my head is that we, we construct a lifelong learning model and we look at each age group um, from uh, you know, birth to pre-K to school age, university age, into adult learning and um, think about what their information needs are in those, uh, in those ages from um, you know, educational resources to resources for for play and entertainment and job seeking and and other kinds of resources. We certainly wouldn't have the ability to um, fund every single need that we could identify. But I wonder if we spent some time thinking about those information needs by age group, mm -hmm. whether or not we could come up with the top one or two resources to meet everyone's needs 
And then wouldn't it be great to make a legislative ask that involved the public libraries and OPI and OCHI to say collectively, this is what we need for digital content to support all Montanans. I like that a lot. It makes a, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And it's kind of hard, I think I would break it down in my own head as to, oh, well, when they're in K-12, they need this base core of, of journals and, um, but yeah, getting, every, getting everybody to cooperate. Um, and also it seems like now is a good time to strike as, as Kate and I, I think had talked about in the past. It's like, it seems like, uh, it's, an, it's again, it's an opportunity because they're going to be looking, I would assume, to be able to flip to online in a lot of ways. So I don't know that that need is going to go away and it wouldn't be more economical if we were all doing it as a group. I, I think that that's great. I also think that we need to prioritize some sort of um, funding with, with marketing and outreach. Um, because I know that lots of times we have stuff and then people don't know. I mean, back when we had the databases, I would get really frustrated because my daughter was in high school and um, she like she would do assignments and the teachers would not like she never got taught about the databases except for from me. Um, so I, I think whatever we put our money in, we also need to make sure that we also have money for making sure it gets used. You're right, Susie. I mean, I think that is that is a huge issue and it's something we're looking at within trails as well. Um, just because we provide access doesn't mean that it's that it's utilized. Um, again, I would say that's something that you can push back on the commercial sector. The vendors that they're looking for something to do in some ways that this is something they can they can provide a lot of support for, I think more than they do. And I also think that that's, um, that's the role of the school librarian. Um, so if the teachers in their classes are not pushing those, that's because they don't have a partnership with their librarian. Um, so I, and it's something that we struggle with trying to make sure that we have the connections and we obviously pay for our own databases at this point and they're heavily used. And that's because of the connection that we have with our classroom teachers and the collaboration that we have with them. If we didn't have that, then they, they would find their own resources. And I think as we were talking about earlier, the concern then is, are they, are they vetted? Are they, you know, are they reliable? Are they, whereas we can say we have these great resources that we're willing to pay for that are best for our students and um, it, it'll support the work that you're trying to do in your classes. Obviously, need for digital resources, I need to give some thought to how we could address that kind of question. Um, there's a suggestion that the state library should reach out to smaller libraries to better understand what kinds of support they need to better support virtual librarianship, if any. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, any, other, um, any other discussion, thoughts? Uh, around, you know, if we're, if we're poised to provide more library yeah. services yeah. via electronic me means, what, what services, what support um, we should be prepared to offer, what kinds of outcomes we, yeah. we might want to expect from libraries.
Kara or Tracy, any other thoughts or questions you want to add? Yeah, at this point, I don't. I actually have been taking notes on that on this one from the earlier conversation because I think there were some things that come up that apply. Um, the themes that I pick up from the NAC is the digital content, the need for more digital content of all kinds, and then uh, the need for us to um, advocate for internet connectivity. I kind of put that under this because I think we all know the internet's kind of the underpinning of this. And then I also added the information literacy to this and the embedded librarianship conversation as well. And the statewide virtual reference. So I just wanted to let the NAC know those were some of the things I heard you say that I included in here as things that we might want to explore and or figure out how to do in the future. Thanks, Tracy. The next topic for discussion is something a little bit more concrete and something we've been talking about for a while now. You're all familiar with the career program and some of the limitations of the career. Uh, we have some resources dedicated based on your recommendations for our FY21 budget to help conduct a career study that might help us address some of the shortcomings of, of uh, the current career. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn things over to Kara to help lead the discussion um, to help us better shape what that, that study might look like. So several of you make use of the career. For those of you who don't, I'll briefly describe our current capacity, we serve about 55 locations and you visualize the Montana roadmap in your mind that basically goes along I-90 and up uh, the um, other interstate. <laughs> 15. 15. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the number. Um, <laughs> up to, up to Great Falls, uh, Helena, Butte, and then we have some connectors going down Bitterroot Valley, um, not on the state contract, but locally, picking up from hubs, going down Bitterroot um, in the uh, the Four Rivers Sharing Group area, and uh, I, I think there are some other local connectors that we're not we're not directly involved with through the state contract. We have been challenged in our procurement process for this contract in having a number of viable offers. And so to some extent, our capacity is limited by what our contract value that is available um, can purchase for us. And so when we entertain the idea of adding a library to the career, it's kind of predicated upon our current service area. And I, I, I think we'd like to think more expansively, especially um, if we want to apply the Fair Library Access Resolution to this and put, put that principle into practice, then we really need to consider like what are all of the options available for any library in the state that wants to reduce their costs in resource sharing, expand resource sharing, uh, join a sharing group if they're in the shared catalog. And so some of the questions that I am very curious about are obviously what's working, what's not working currently. Where is the greatest need that is currently unmet where we, we need to prioritize expansion if possible? Um, what opportunities are available in those areas? What would ideal statewide career service look like and how much would that cost? And what would be our success measures? 
for that service. And so I'd like to know if there are other questions that I'm missing or some other blind spot that you can point out to me as we're thinking through the data that we need to gather in order to make better decisions uh, for this program. So, Kara, can you remind me who's getting the questions? <laughs> who's, who are we doing the survey for? Just all, libraries or couriers or? Um... That's a really good question. <laughs> Since we haven't started yet, it could be any of those. And we, we, we this is very, very preliminary. So, what do you have in mind is what would be most effective? Well, um, I think it would be helpful to ask others, I'm always saying this, so sorry, um, statewide couriers in other states, these questions would be great too because um, we can see how it works for them. If it, what works and what doesn't. Um, and then personally, a thought I've had for what question is timing to how long is it taking to get, you know, from one place to another. I think historically that's been Bridge or Nets issue and question. And so I think that's a good one to, to address. I think the subsequent question is how long are patrons willing to wait? And I think that is really variable by you know, geographic region. It seems that there, there's a higher tolerance in some of the more rural areas because they're not expecting to get things the next day, whereas that's not acceptable uh, among academic libraries, particularly they, they are, mm, they um, are more frustrated with the, uh, the lag time in our, our current service. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that we've visited some before um, with the postal service and they have some programs, um, if you get the right yes. person to talk to, they have some programs that you can link to so where we can't reach people through a courier service we should be able to link up with that postal program that mm -hmm. things there i think the thing we need is we need the people to do the research and ev you know every community in montana knows whether they have some kind of a small courier that goes from point a to point b and then somebody just needs to link all that. But first, I don't know how long it's been since we've asked libraries who is even interested. We have lots of new directors and lots of new staff across the state of Montana in libraries that were not interested before or libraries that were interested who couldn't get service. So. That seems to be kind of where we sh need to start is finding out where the interest lies. Dara, correct me if I if I misstate here, but the one of the most successful um, courier services is is in Oregon and Washington and Idaho. It's the Orbis Cascade um, system, which is primarily academic libraries. The libraries spend a great deal of money each year to be part of their shared catalog system and to enjoy the courier services. Um, there's no shortage of businesses willing to do, to provide the service out there so they're able to go out to bid and receive competitive responses. Their pattern at least used to be that they would basically have a flat rate for the year uh, in a schedule and, and um, uh, quite frequent uh, drop-offs, I mean, I think daily drop-offs for the the places. It was limited to the academic libraries, so they kind of solved some of the problem there. 
but uh, I know that the volume was so high that they were, even though the costs were significant, that they were sharing materials for less than 20 cents an item, um, total costs. So the, 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 to me, uh, the, two, the two lessons I derive from that are, are, are one, you know, the people who are using the services, both the librarians and the users, absolutely adored it. Uh, my uh, youngest went to school in Walla Walla and she was getting material from the big academic institutions around this, around Oregon, Washington, Idaho, you know, within a day or two. And that was wonderful for her there. Um, they also just are playing with a lot more people and a lot more money. And some of their options, some, some, some of their opportunities are not opportunities for us without, well, they're just not opportunities for us. So we have to kind of rethink some of that kind of stuff. I would be curious, Kara, if you knew anything about Minitex and some of those services, which more uh, closely mimic our more rural situation and, and how they're doing those. It's been a couple of years since I've spoken with somebody from Minitex, but that's another consortium that is uh, heavily driven by academic library coordination and use, and it, it does provide service to more publics, however. And we were actually looking at a possible connection to Montana, because <laughs> they go as far west as Williston. And I thought, oh, that's just so close to Sydney. And, and um, that's, I, I don't have any really direct lessons to apply to our situation, other than I was looking for some interstate partnership opportunities. Orbis Cascade uh, delivers to Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, but I, I think what they have in both of those situations is they do have some substantial um, state level subsidies going into those programs. Right, right. And, and it strikes me that this is the kind of service that um, would have to be heavily subsidized to work for folks and would probably also in Montana uh, have to be sort of multimodal in that um, what works for, for Missoula and Bozeman and Billings may not work for libraries along the Highline. Yeah, and another reason I think we'd have to, ha to have some kind of front load, some big subsidy is that to get people to join it, if there's not currently demand, then it's so prohibitively expensive for them to join. It's like, well, I could just mail it. It will cost twice as much to put it in the courier if I'm only sending out four items a month because nobody wants ILL. But if if they just had the service and they could provide those things cheaper than mail, then they might have more ILL. We haven't been able to test that, but um, that capacity issue kind of, it's kind of a self-selected group right now of people who find it to be a good value. Well, the, the one thing that still stands out to me is that we have, we, have, we, we have a group of libraries that have in the past and continue to find it to be a good value. So it's a great tool for those libraries and that's, that's great. The, we have patrons on the high line and tucked away in the corners of our great state who don't enjoy the service, who don't have the kind of the virtual expanded, um, we don't have the sharing groups with the shared catalogs and stuff that makes it so transparent and so easy to be a patron. And, and um, while acknowledging the, uh, the, the courier service to, and thinking about it as a, as a tool, I'd also like to think about it as, you know, uh, to me, it seems like a key component in providing really excellent library services to all Montanans. And, um, uh, not knowing how to crack that that nut, it seems to me that we should consider it um, in, as we think about you know fair, the fair use um, resolution and just our our intent to take and make it possible to be a Montana anywhere in the state and receive sort of a certain basic essential level of library services, which includes um, convenient access to a wide range of, of materials, print materials. Now that's of course ignoring all the money stuff. But I sometimes wonder if we should ignore the money stuff 
and shape a study around an ideal resource sharing model where every library is participating. Um, we you know, can probably make some fairly good estimates about the number of items that would be shared based on uh, those kinds of behaviors and make some assumptions about what, what um, some reasonable delivery models might look like and just say, if, if, this is, if this is the gold standard, what does that cost? I worry a little bit about asking libraries whether or not they participate in, in spending a lot of time getting that kind of data. If the results of that survey would be skewed by our current understanding of the career availability uh, and some of the challenges that we've faced over the years. Um, we know obviously that we could scale down from the gold standard, but uh, if, if a gold standard were available to us and libraries would then participate knowing that it was available, what would that cost? I know at one point Minitex, I think it was Minitex, was providing was, was, was a homebrew courier service. They couldn't find someone to deliver in the manner they wanted to the libraries that knew, wanted to have the courier service. And so they, if I recall correctly, they kind of did their own with lease trucks and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't know if that's still, still the case. It seems to me that any good study would at least look at that option as well as, as, as commercial options. Um, just if for no other reason to give us sort of a um, baseline. It, it, you know, the other thing is, is, as we think about all this kind of stuff, we want to make things more convenient, not just for patrons, but also for the librarians and the libraries that are having to handle what I presume a successful career service would, would, would result in, which would be an increased volume of materials moving from library to library. And if, if we take if we take and, and, and cripple libraries by giving them too much work to do too inefficiently, then we haven't really solved any problems there. We need to come up with something that's just slick. And coming up with something that is slick in terms of libraries' ability to kind of handle this stuff efficiently um, is worth a great deal of money. That has value just in itself. So I love your idea, Jenny, of, of thinking about resource sharing more generally. I would, I would, um, I would push for us to consider it from the user's point of view. How do we take and reduce the friction for patrons to get whatever they want, and then go from there? And you know, and then you know, look at policy and funding and those kinds of things after we've looked at sort of this perfect system. Or not perfect, but pretty damn good system. And or am I some being somewhat reality based? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think that it's, I think we need to know what's out there and what's available in the state and have a great idea of what, what is a good system to offer. <laughs> going to have to be a lot of things connecting, not just one company that can do it. Um, just in our area between us and Stevensville and Darby and Hamilton, we use one courier, we use something else for um, planes. It, it's just a conglomeration in Mineral County. It's a conglomeration of things that just all come together. But uh one person needs to be able to kind of manage that. It's too hard for little libraries to find those connections. I'm, I'm wondering if other large libraries who are currently, I presume, experiencing the stress of, of moving materials from, from, you know, within a sharing group would agree with, with an or. I mean, Kip, does that make sense to, to your group?
Can you repeat what you said in art? <laughs> Sorry. Is she there? I have to unmute first. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> I think that it needs to be managed by one person so little libraries don't have to try to figure out how they can play because they need to figure out a connection mm -hmm. to the pub or to some someplace else. So I agree with Jenny that having the perfect package is what we need to look at and then um, see how that can all work together to make it something that we can accomplish. Yeah, so my um, uh, past in Colorado, I was in a rural district on the western side of Colorado, and we had a statewide career through CLIC, um, which is Colorado Library Cons Consortium. Um, and so they managed everything. Um, and then we had hubs in different regions of Colorado that were kind of the hubs for the actual materials being delivered. Um, but it was nice to have that one entity kind of taking care of managing the whole project. Um, so I do agree that that would be helpful. I think we're in such a small sharing group right now um, with Gallatin Valley or Gallatin County that we, we are okay right now as far as kind of all five of us managing it. But I think if it were a bigger um, project, it would need to be solidified. And I'm, I'm thinking the courier service by itself is always going to be really expensive, but that when you would look at it from sort of a broader business sense and, and look at it when combined with some of these other services like partner groups and perhaps um, some shared acquisition and uh, collection development planning and, and et cetera like this, all of a sudden you're, you're, the, the benefit sort of rises. And so um, while, while it's expensive, it's part and parcel of this, this larger kind of scheme, which has intrinsically uh, 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 sufficient value to take and, and justify the extra expenses. I think just courier service by itself will always seem impossibly expensive. But as part of this larger thing, I think it probably does pencil out because you can say, uh, you can you can identify the, the 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 points of value to both your library in terms of cost, uh, and and also to your users in terms of um, in terms of benefits. It strikes me that there there seems to be an opportunity here for a oft used public private partnership. You know, we don't have to be logistics experts. There are logistics experts out there that I'm, I'm sure would be happy to contract with us, maybe even perhaps provide some services for the greater good. Don't know. Are you speaking uh, for a study, uh, Jenny? Well, long-term, for long-term management as well. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, you've heard me say this before, and I still think it's viable that the state of Montana sends materials around to every county, and there is no reason that a courier system that we would develop couldn't be um, the access that the state has to all the counties in Montana. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I was hoping that Nora was going to say part and parcel. <laughs> I, I would just like to say that I think it's important that we, that the sorting <laughs> um, be part of that. It's not just shipping the thing from one place to another, but I know it's not ideal that Great Falls, and we're very grateful, sends all of our stuff to Missoula and then they sort it and send it out. And that's part of the reason why it takes a long time to get places. 
So um, having a, a contractor that can, rather than having it go two places, um, Susie, I'm not sticking up for my staff, but whatever comes in in the morning, leave the next morning um, on the courier to go out into the rest of the state. We get 40 crates a day and they are done by the time Laura goes home at six o'clock at night. And so the hang up is along the way somewhere. And that I think is part of fact that we just don't have a reliable system. We, we need something that's more reliable than what we have right now. It sits in different libraries who aren't opened or who don't have yeah. a staff. Kalispell has a very difficult time getting through all their crates every day. They don't have the staff to do it. And so I think you're very right the you know we used to have a courier that did sorting we don't anymore yeah and i think that that's been a big concern for us in joining partners too is we don't quite have the staff capacity if we were a hub that would be pretty difficult for us at this point so again i'd like to argue if we do a study let's consider the whole business process of both starting at discovery and ending at kind of return mm -hmm. Uh, if there is a return um, and, and looking at all those business processes and how they how they kind of interleave and 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 what their costs are and what the value is and and look at the whole ball of wax because just talking about moving a box of books from one point to the other ignores obvious things like sorting and and, and those kinds of things um, if we if we if we hire somebody to look at this from a logistical point of view and I know we've talked about looking at the, uh, uh, the business logistics people at MSU, they really, need, they really need one way or the other to get the perspective of the libraries uh, and librarians who are working with this stuff so they understand the whole, the whole ball of wax, not just getting a box. And I don't know if we've helped you or made your job harder. I, I appreciate your comments. I want this to not be an academic study, but with apologies to our academic library friends, but I want this to be something that we can, from which we can make concrete steps to actually do some of the things we're envisioning and not just have this be a a neat study, you know, so I'm, 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 I'm eager for suggestions. This is something we've been thinking about for too long. And um, so I'd, I'd like to see some improvements. One of my desired outcomes is that we have better career is used. We currently rely on manual counts from libraries. And those are just crate numbers that are sent and that data has never been comprehensive. And it doesn't really tell us anything about the way that materials are flowing across the state and where any possible bottlenecks are occurring that is leading to the dissatisfaction that some libraries are experiencing and um, Having some kind of tracking system would be great for both of those purposes. So that that's on my wish list. So I think, think Kara, I'm, I'm sorry. I no, think you have um, a person. Uh, you hire a person who is in charge of that, who is keeping track of that all the time. They see how the crates move. They know where the bottlenecks are instead of. Mitch going to call somebody to find out that there's 15 crates of his sitting in a storage shed somewhere that the courier dropped off. I, I think that um, a, real, a real logistics person would, would have a scanner and keep track of that kind of stuff. They would keep track of data where we're just all trying to get our materials to move so that they get wherever they're supposed to be and patrons are happy.
tracking devices <laughs> on the crates. I've said that too. You'd pop one. Yes, you you do that, right? You could do that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe drones. Maybe that should be the. <laughs> well. <laughs> Any other follow-up questions, Tara, or any other feedback for Tara? Anybody want to volunteer to help Tara? I would love to help you, Kara, if I can be of any help to you. Thank you, Lenore. I'm also willing to help <laughs> if you need more than one. Stacy says Sonia and she will help as well. Thank you all. Well, Kara, now that you've got enough people volunteered, I'll help too. <laughs> it, it wasn't wasn't there money? Who doesn't aside? want to help me? Just <laughs> say who doesn't want to help me. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't there money set aside uh, for this study? There is, Bruce, yes. So we budgeted about 10000 So that's not a huge amount of money, but if that helps, if, and if there's more money that's needed, we could always approach the commission and ask for more money. It just strikes me this is, this is something we've been trying to figure out for some time, and we've been kind of limping, limping by, but I think we can do better than that. It sounds like maybe this is um, the beginning of doing better. Right. For our last topic of discussion, I'm going to turn things over to Tracy. Uh, under the umbrella of the Fair Library Access Resolution, uh, we want to spend some time thinking specifically about uh, questions of equity, diversity, including services to our minorities, uh, those with differing abilities, underserved, um, what outcomes we want to see in Montana, and then uh, what equity, what would it look like in our organizations and in our services? And again, this is a, an, another discussion in helping the State Library to plan for how we can um, most effectively, effectively address positive outcomes in this area. And before we jump in, do people need a break? Thanks for asking, Tracy. Yeah, it's pretty intense thinking. I mean, we can go through it. I just kind of wanted to make sure, check in on people. Not, not seeing any thumbs up, so. All right. So the reason I brought this to the NAC uh, is um, a couple of reasons, I think. And I first want to say and acknowledge that the Fair Library Access Resolution is about all Montanans, no matter who they are, getting the services they need. The reason I brought this to the NAC is, is first of all, the staff who work closely with libraries have really begun to watch what is going on in our nation and in our communities. And because they work with library directors, they also have library director friends who are kind of also pointing out the need to address barriers that um, people of color in particular um, may be experiencing as they use library services or try to use library services. And so we really wanted to try to finally address this topic 
and I know in some of our training, we are going to attempt to address equity, diversity, and inclusion, the implicit bias training, and then uh, continuing to train on looking at your collections and your services and trying to identify ways to better serve people and to make sure that all voices are heard. The other reason I would like your help on this is that um, we have received a $170,000 IMLS Community Catalyst Grant that will involve not just Montana, but several other states in the West. And it starts out looking at implicit bias training and EDI training with the, the stated goal for people who attend that training of going into their strategic planning process to try and uh, hear what the underserved in their communities are saying and then to build strategic plans and goals that perhaps try to take down those barriers and provide better services. And so I thought the NAC was a good one for me to just kind of test the waters and uh, see where you are at. Um, and my first question for you is, are any of you doing anything right now in this area? Um, with equity, diversity, and inclusion, and taking down some of the barriers. It's okay if the answer is no. I just was curious, first of all, if anyone is doing anything, and I'd like to know about your experience. Um, our city um, is funding some training coming up. We don't know the details yet. Um, but interesting enough, they did switch some of the police budget over to this training specifically for all staff um, in the city. So I think that's pretty good and um, looking forward to that. We're also looking just um, about of some that are library specific, um, just us as a library, but we haven't really dived in to it yet. Thanks, Kit. Is there anyone else doing any of this kind of work or starting it? We we have been kind of talking about it a little bit, but we haven't. We don't have any actual um, concrete things that we're doing. Um, I did. We have a position open right now, and I just I had a con conversation with our HR director um, about having an explicit goal of having the staff of the library reflect um, the makeup of the community and um, it was it was a pretty disappointing call with HR and she basically mm -hmm. said I don't have I don't have time to take that on can we talk in 2021 <laughs> so um, so I am and in, in her defense there she's got a lot with COVID and and they're implementing some new software um, but so I we have intentionally tried to send um, those job job things out to our um, uh, partners who are um, persons of color um, and we're trying to partner with uh, I'm doing some work with Amelia about civic engagement and um, trying to figure out how to have some conversations around a, a variety of issues including um, diversity and inclusion. I also offered to be a resource to our our, our department head team about information on this and was told that they were not interested. Well, Missoula um, city and county um, are working together to do police reform as well as um, training amongst all employees in the city and the count and the county. Um, so we're looking forward to see what come what will come of that and um, from that we'll plan some changes in library services if there's something um, that can be changed. Um, we, you know, we feel like we help everybody who comes in or who we reach through outreach and we have a lot of outreach programs but you can always do a better job. We just kind of need to know the nitty gritty of how to get into um, 
those groups and um, and and be able to to do something to help. Um, we feel really excited because for once we have a diverse person working at the library. We never get anyone except for white individuals that apply for jobs. And we have a Syrian refugee male who applied for one of our maintenance positions. And he's fantastic. He's so thrilled to have a job that pays um, so his family can exist. And, um, and he's been an inspiration to everybody because when we think things are kind of down, all we have to do is look at Shadi and how up and exciting he is to be there and talk about sending money home to his family from the little bit of money that he makes. So it's such an inspiration to have um, someone from, from a diverse culture work with you. We hope we get more in the future. I think that in addition to these conversations about, you know, equity, I think it's, it's moving. Um, I think we need to consider what about not just considering how we better serve, but what are we doing about, you know, anti-racism? Um, because I think that that we're going to encounter that more and more. Um, and I just wanted to note that I really liked Gavin's um, letter that he sent a few months ago. I could probably dig it up and send it to you guys um, in the wake of, of everything that's happening race related. And it felt like it was motivating, but I didn't really see anybody. I, I emailed him offline, but I didn't really see any conversation about that, which was interesting. And I, and it, I know there's people have been doing lots of different things and everybody's crazy busy, but um, yeah, I'm just wondering what, if, if that's part of, we move a little bit beyond equity. This is Bruce. I too like Gavin's letter. Uh, what, I, what I think about is, uh, or wonder about is, um, would the state library spend money differently if it was concerned about treating those with different abilities, minorities, underserved, um, more equitably? And I think the answer is yes. And um, you are the group that I would look for for help in figuring out how we do that. You know, bouncing back to the courier service, you know, why shouldn't every library in the state have um, easy discovery and easy easy delivery for materials? And that's a minor thing, but it's sort of low hanging fruit. Well, I guess one of the other things that I have really thought about in this is. Um, I feel like with patron behavior, it is it is really hard that it is either our staff or people in uniforms with guns. Like, I mean, there's no there's no middle. If, if somebody is not behaving at the library and and we can't de-escalate the situation, I mean, we don't have resources. Um, other than calling the police. And um, we do have some crisis intervention teams here in Great Falls, but you can only access them through the police. And um, I, I just, I don't know that that's the most friendly way for us to, to respond. And I also know that it shouldn't be the job of my staff to deal with somebody who's maybe having a mental health issue or, or whatever that's dropping F-bombs and that's angry. Um, and this whole conversation about what is the role of police and what is the role um, uh, of different agencies. I, I think as we deal with patron behavior, we really need to think about, um, you know, how do we contribute to that and um, what can we do to make libraries more welcoming and open for all of them, for everyone.
I'm not sure if any of you were at the last MLA board meeting, but we did have a big discussion there and um, and I believe um, Gavin put on wired a request to start some committees, which I can't find right now. Um, but it is a discussion going on in the MLA board as well. Um, not sure if any of you were there, maybe Jenny. Yeah, um, yeah, you were. So, um, and I'm trying to find the meeting minutes too. I'm having no luck here, but um, but it was a very in depth, great conversation. Wanting to um, bring more people um, of color into our field, or not just our field, but even into the. MLA board or a committee or something like that. So, so it was good. I think it was in focus kit. That's where oh. I saw it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't chime in and say um, MSU, at least the library, we've had some discussions about it um, and we've started and I, and I, racist training. We've actually had a session, two sessions, and there's uh, an additional two. And uh, on top of that, Trails is looking at doing some programming. Um, although I haven't checked back, Christina Trunnell is handling most of that. But um, so we're looking at doing doing programming or something as well. So we'd be interested in, and I assume, um, coordinating with anyone else um, or the MLA or, or whatnot, if, if that would be helpful. So my next question for you then is thinking about where you are at in your different libraries and what you see, what do you think are the next steps? Are we at the beginning of having the discussions about anti-racism and about educating ourselves? Is that where we are in the process? Or what do you see as the needs? It, it, and it's about more than racism, is that correct? Yeah, um, it's about maybe a, a more fair and just world. But there's an interesting book that, that says that it's not about being black, it's about, about caste and makes an argument that just happens that blacks get to be the underclass. We have class and castes in Montana as well. And not all of them um, are are black or brown. Um, it strikes me that the the intent, I believe, of the fair use resolution was inclusive. We we went out of our way not to talk about uh, race, but also about you know gender equity to include by omission, sort of, to include gender equity and and sex and economic and educational attainment and, and all this other kind of stuff that we think that just simply all Montanans have a have, uh, right to equitable access to get the stuff that is efficient and to what they need. And it's, it's, it's certainly about race. And like uh, a friend of mine says, uh, everyone, everyone is protected by the fire department, but the fire department goes to, to that house, which is on fire. And clearly, and clearly there's a lot of uh, racism that goes on in Montana in our world that needs to be addressed uh, too sweet. But I think the problem is larger and I think our strategies have to be larger. So I'm probably gonna do this wrong because I'm just now kind of educating myself about the systems of racism. I will say one of my concerns, and this could be due to my own lack of understanding, is that one of the ways we can continue to contribute to the problem is by trying to go larger and by not naming the problem, if that makes sense, um, that we don't, that we use terminology or language that doesn't address the fact 
that there is systemic racism that keeps certain people because of the color of their skin from having and enjoying the same privileges that those of us who are white might have if that's and I'm probably doing that wrong Bruce I just I am educating myself and trying to to do as Sarah said be anti-racist and um, one of the things that they talk about is in fact the importance of naming it and not sweeping it under the rug that's why I spoke I'm, I'm with you and Tracy we're all bozos on this bus Having having said that, um, I think I th racism. I believe that. Well, this is probably a conversation over a glass of wine. Let me go get a bottle. <laughs> um, my understanding of the fair race use resolution was was larger and more inclusive. I think if 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 you want to talk about racism. Uh, then, then, which I think is worthy of discussion and worthy of being addressed, then maybe we should confront it more directly. I'm not sure that the fair access, fair access resolution is the perfect vehicle for that. Um, although it may contain ways at it with, within, but, but if we want to confront um, a racism and, and the systemic racism, and perhaps have libraries examine um, how they treat staff and clients in their communities. Um, with that in mind, then maybe, maybe there, we should approach it more directly. But 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 having said that, I don't think you should ever apologize for fumbling with this stuff because, like I say, we're all, I believe, fumbling with this. We're all learning. I guess I would just say I think it's both. I think I've always viewed the Fair Library Access Resolution as a statement of our conviction. And as you said, Bruce, all means all. We, we were, we avoided naming groups so that we could mean everyone. Uh, but the barriers for particular groups of people um, that exist that stand in the way of us achieving the vision of the Fair, Fair Labor Access Resolution um, may be specific to those individual groups and by identifying them, naming them, uh, and calling attention to them, we can work to address those specific barriers. And Bruce, I definitely recognize that you meant everyone in the Fair Library Access Resolution. And I think it's, um, well, it's what you said earlier. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And, you know, I'm, I, and I think I'm kind of speaking for the staff who work with libraries. We have a strong desire to make the Fair Library Access a resol resolution a reality. And that means we have to start somewhere. And what we, are seeing as a nation and what we are hearing from some of our communities makes us think this is a place to start. It's not the end by any means, it's just a beginning and that we do need to think about other audiences and I think we've been doing that. I guess I would just say maybe, maybe we haven't been as good in the past about thinking about people of color and how they use libraries and, and their culture and this is an opportunity for us to do something different. Well, I'm all for that, and I will do everything I can humanly to, to support you with that and to help. So, I guess my question for you then uh, for the group would be what, what are the next steps? What would equity look like? Well, 
I am very committed to, to us being anti-racist, and I think this is a, a great platform for us to realize that there are some barriers and that libraries in general tend to be really white spaces. Um, and it seems to me that um, one of the things that we could do is we could set up some time to listen um, and maybe maybe do some outreach to communities of color and to say, you know, how well do your libraries serve you? What are the barriers for you being served? Um, um, you know, that's something I know that we in Great Falls have um, thought about doing during our next strategic plan is trying to especially, um, we have a large urban Indian population and um, we don't have a lot of good data about how they use the library and how um, how our services work for them. So I think I think the next step would be let's try to listen to some communities of color and see what they think. Are are there things that we need to know? I think simply by asking this question, I'm answering it about how effectively to engage with communities of color. Um, I, I'd be, I'm a little bit hesitant uh, in how to approach those conversations because I think there's some cultural sensitivity in just how we approach them in the conversation that we might need to, to know more about to make that process effective. seems to me that the most important skill here is um, listening. So if you were going to be approaching communities of color, how would you go about doing that? Tribal councils? I see that. Thank you, Catherine. I would I would begin by doing whatever Joy told me to do. <laughs> I well, some of it comes down to relationships. I've been just trying to build relationships with some of the um, uh, the black leaders in Great Falls and some of the. Um, strong um, Indian women in, in Great Falls and then inviting them to, to have a voice. But I, I think it takes time to build those relationships. So I don't know the best way to move forward. I just, I just think that probably the NAC doesn't necessarily have the best um, insight right at this moment of how we can make the changes, but that we can say that we think we should listen. Well, we do have the connection and trails of, of having the um, seven tribal schools amongst our members. So um, obviously we, we talk with the tribal school library directors and Joy can, Joy can pipe up anytime she wants here, but I mean, that might be uh, one, one place to start, I don't know. I think like the issue like right now, um, Haver is a community that is right between two major reservations between Blackbeat and between the Chippewa Cree. Uh, right now, uh, with COVID, we're having some severe racial issues with Haver. Um, we've been seeing a lot of posts. Um, I don't know if many of you know, we just came out of a 72 hour mandatory reservation wide lockdown and the tribal council wasn't telling us exactly why we were going into lockdown and when our chairman mr baker posted it 
to online saying, you know, we're going into lockdown Sunday night at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. and we're not going to come out of it until Wednesday at 6 a.m. You know, we're locked down into the reservation. There were so many negative comments out of Haver saying, you know, oh, well, we don't want you coming into Haver because the native population is what is bringing in the, the, the virus. We're being told, we're, sorry, I'm getting emotional. We can't go into Walmart without people walking away from us, you know, and, you know, they know who the native community is. And if it wasn't for these native communities, Haver would fall apart. They're surrounded by so many natives and yet we're treated like garbage because we can't, they're saying we're the ones bringing the virus, you know, into Haver. And, um, and I know that they're, they're saying that because we had two deaths recently on the reservation. And the reason that the tribal council lock, locked us down is because people who attended these two funerals within two days of each other, some are not getting tested. They're refusing to get tested. They're refusing to go into quarantine. And so the virus is spreading. And now we're finding out, you know, because of contact tracing, there's like a chance that there's 46 new cases on the reservation as of yesterday. And they're posting online saying, you know, if, if Rocky Boy can lock down their borders and saying we can't go into their reservation and they can't come out, then Haver should lock down their borders and say, you know, people from Fort Belknap and from Browning and from Rocky Boy can't come into Haver to do their shopping. Well, if that is the case, then we're, I mean, it's like they're saying we're, we're frolicking around and giving out, giving away the virus like candy. And I'm feeling like I have to travel like a hundred miles to Great Falls just to buy groceries for three households that I have, you know, that I'm taking care of here. And, and it just makes me so upset that instead of this virus making us better people, it's making us worse. And just, you know, I don't look native, which is probably why I haven't experienced a lot of it, but they know that I, I live out here and that I work out here. And so I haven't experienced it directly, but seeing so much of my family and my friends and my coworkers experience this thing where they'll walk into a store and people will just, you know, immediately go in the opposite direction of them. Um, we, we're doing everything our tribal council and the CDC and everything is telling us to do. And yet I just feel like I'm honestly scared to go through the checkpoint and tell them I'm going to have her to get water for my grandma, you know, or for my aunties and stuff. And so I've been working from home for the last week since we went into lockdown. And I know I have to go in and pay some bills tomorrow when I get off work. And I'm honestly very uncomfortable having to go anywhere. And I don't know if this, uh, that any of what I just said pertain to anything that you guys are talking about, but I just feel, scared right now and I'm supposed to go back to work on Monday and we're getting ready to start school on the 24th and you know we've been like right now I know that they're up at the college spraying down everything you know and getting us ready for school to start on the 24th and I'm scared to send my my son to school on the 24th and you know I just I want everyone to be safe and I want us, you know, to go back to some semblance of being, you know, back to normal and everything, but I just don't know what, you know, what that is right now. Thank you for sharing that, Joy. Yeah, Joy, I really, really, I'm sorry, Tracy. Oh, I, no. I really, really appreciate hearing, hearing that directly from you, but it also kind of nauseates me, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, that's, that we're not, they're not past that stage. It's pretty reprehensible. Um, I don't know if there's something that, yeah, libraries could do in Montana to start healing divides and correcting whatever it is, racism, um, that would be great. I don't know if the group you know, I, I feel like we want to, I want to do something for you, Joy, to help you with your current situation, too. Um, that makes me furious.
Yeah. And I'm so sorry Great for, sh for sharing that. I, I understand the life doesn't always work this way, but I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, what, what can I do? What can we do? And that's what this is about, Bruce. Is I've been hearing stories like Joy's, and I'm like, that's not right. And, and I've been hearing similar stories as well, and it's not right. You know, I guess kindness is something that just maybe when people are frightened, it doesn't happen. I don't know. I was hoping that this pandemic would make people be more kind to each other. But we've had a couple staff members who had possibilities of being in contact with a spouse or somebody else that had um, COVID. And I've been really impressed by how my staff has not been hateful to each other. They've understood that this kind of stuff happens, but in the city as a whole, that's not true. People begin to point fingers and, um, and you have no idea if you've been around somebody who has been exposed. I mean, it's not a choice people make. And I don't know how you make people be kind. I've heard that there's this amazing treasure trove of the wisdom of the ages that you can actually look stuff up and read it and learn from it in these places called libraries. I'm not being sarcastic. I've, oft, I've always thought that, that libraries were one of the true free, open for everyone places where we can try to accumulate some wisdom, which I think kindness is a subset of. Or maybe, maybe kindness is the, the, the on top and wisdom is a subset. But yeah, I mean, we all need courage. I think everyone's afraid and we all do stupid things when we're afraid, myself included. Well, and Bruce, I think that the fact that this has become a political issue on top of a health issue, now people are picking sides of who do I believe? Do I believe science or do I believe my political friends? And that makes it really difficult to, to get through to people what the truth is, I guess. I, I don't know, it, it's very frightening. But even if you present the truth and you present data and you prevent, present facts and you do all that stuff, it can fall on completely and totally deaf ears because that's the nature, right, of prejudice and, and hatred. It's not necessarily an intellectual thing, it's an emotional thing. Um, Absolutely. So how, yeah, so how do you wrestle with that? And I've thought about this so many times. It's like, well, you don't know people's experiences. They've been brought up in a prejudiced household. Uh, they, they had one bad experience with somebody and then they stereotype everything and everyone. Um, so normally I would say, talk to people, just get people to talk to people. But now we can't do that because we're in a pandemic. So it's, yeah. Maybe we shouldn't try to solve the whole problem of racism in, in, in the United States in one, <laughs> but we should, Although it wouldn't be nice if we could. Yeah, it'd be great. But wouldn't what, maybe we should we should pick out a couple low hanging fruit? And it sounds like Tracy, you've got some low hanging fruit in hand. I wanted to jump in and add a couple of thoughts. Joy, I think I I too appreciate you sharing your concerns. This is exactly the kind of group I hope, and I'm glad that you feel like you can share with. As we started off discussing this morning. We're so fortunate to have a group of librarians within our state that we can lean on and trust uh, and, and talk about these kinds of issues. So I think a lot of the behavior that we see 
the unkindness that we see. People are allowing it to happen. They're modeling that kind of behavior and, and it's promulgating within our communities. And one of the, the simplest things that we can do is to just model the kind of behavior that we want to see personally and within our, within our libraries and, and have that kind of behavior reject the kind of negative behaviors that Joy described and, and that we're seeing. Uh, I think we've, we've talked a lot during our COVID meetups about just words to use, language to use to help respond to some of the civil disobedience and, and maybe we also need to include um, either in those meetings or in another kind of community of practice, words of kindness and behaviors that demonstrate kindness and, and how to help staff and others respond effectively to the kinds of negative behaviors that we're seeing. I think if we can create that kind of community support, um, counter the support that exists for the unkindness, it might be a positive step in that direction. And I would also say libraries can play a role in changing the way that people of color are portrayed <clears throat> through our collections and through our programming, which is a point Stacy made. Is there's a lot of negative stereotypes that people have and that um, contributes to the implicit bias that might make people, especially when they're afraid, behave in the ways that Joy described. And that's something libraries can be a part of, is telling the whole story. And not just actually the historical story, but the modern story um, as well. I think I mainly was truly testing you NAC members because you know I think it's going to take some courage on the part of staff to go down this road and I wanted to see what your reactions were because we've talked as a staff about the importance of listening and courage and also the importance of being uncomfortable because to really get at the heart of this and address it you have to talk about really tough stuff. And Jody was right that there's a need to make sure that people feel safe. Is there anything else um, you would like me to capture about this particular issue or make sure that we pursue? And, oh, uh, go ahead. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree that we need to talk about kindness and we need to talk about things, but I also really want there to be a recognition of the fact that this is not just about people and their feelings. It's also about systems that have been put in place. Um, you know, there's a reason why people don't have as much, you know, wealth and there's a re you know, th these systemic things. Um, and if, if no people of color are becoming librarians, you know, it, it's not it's not the people of color that are broken. It might be that our system is not welcoming and that we need to look at that. And so I, I, I truly believe that 99% of all the librarians have good hearts and good meaning, but having a good heart is not enough when it's a systemic issue off of soapbox. You can at me later. But it starts with a good heart, right? One good heart. <laughs> but that's not enough. I mean, like when we say, oh, I, I meant good things when I came into Haiti and gave you free health care. I didn't mean to destroy your existing doctors because they couldn't make any money. You know, you know, like we you got to have more than that. But yes, you're right, Pamela. Yes. But somehow, Susie, we need to help people understand that because they may think they're doing the right thing when they're not. 
putting a Band-Aid on something sometimes seems like the right thing to do, but it never is. It just seemed like it at the time. I will say that this is a knack that I'm proud to be part of. Why, thank you, Bruce. He meant except for you and or everybody else. And Suzanne posted, because this actually is a topic of great passion for Suzanne as well, a good heart, courage, and willingness to take risks and learn, and I think admit when we made mistakes and apologize. I would add that too. All right. I appreciate your help with this one. I know it was kind of a tough topic and I, I did take notes um, on this and we'll kind of continue down this road. Um, I guess uh, Kara or Suzanne, is there anything you want to add to the conversation? Or do you think this gives us enough to get started? I, I, I would like to add a personal comment about this topic. Uh, a couple of colleagues at the State Library and I are going through a, a program, um, anti-racism training. Um, it was optional and we decided that that would be useful for us and um, to the point of good intentions. Um, I was certainly raised to treat people well to the best of my ability and I've always had good intentions but through this course I'm realizing that there are definitely blind spots in in my perspective that um, and history that I was not taught in school that aid in bolstering those good intentions with uh, better actions. Um, and so um, I think that there's a lot of defensiveness around this topic because people feel that they, they don't, they, most everybody does not intend to exercise prejudice against others. We, we, most of us have good intentions, but if we're not aware of the impact of some of our actions, then um, that's still harmful. Um, so for us to be able to move this work forward, I think we have to be able to get people out of that defensive place where they feel like they're being judged. Because um, I, I want to just be an example of somebody who has good intentions, but still has a lot to learn and can can uh, can do better. So I guess that's the message that I'd like to convey if we start thinking about how to roll out this sort of training on implicit biases. Yeah, exactly, that we, we can all do better. If there is training, wouldn't it be nice if it was available to uh library board members and state library commissioners. We can make that happen. <laughs> Happily. So sign me up as long as I don't have to get in a small room and read the other people's air. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate um, what's already been said too. I've been I've been doing some work in this area as well, and you know, and one of the first things you realize is um, how you know how you come up short, even you know, despite good intentions. And you know, and I think that's that's okay. That's not something that we should ever beat ourselves up about, because you know we are learning and we're trying. And um, but. I think as librarians, one of the things that we're committed to, and one of the things that um, Pam and I did last week, was it last week, week before, it's all running together in my COVID brain, but um, in the United for Libraries thing, um, 
we were talking about the whys that we do things. And many of us are librarians because, you know, we truly believe in making the world a better place in, um, in, our, in making our communities better. And that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing the work. And so, you know, a part of this is recognizing when we're not doing what we can. Um, when we're not recognizing parts of our communities that we just haven't recognized. And it's not for any ill intent. It's just, um, you know, we have our mindset and we've created these lovely, you know, most of us are white middle class. And we've created these lovely white middle class institutions that serve other white middle class people just perfectly wonderfully. Um, people who fall outside of that, it's, um, you know, it may be difficult for them. Um, and you know not intentionally in any way but you know just the way we set things up um, just seems so logical and comfortable to us and it's um, very alienating for other people and so you know what we're trying to do is um, work on those mindsets and right it's not just about race it's about people um, with differing abilities um, you know that you know we've talked a lot about um, you know, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you know, how to make libraries more, um, more welcoming and more useful for people with differing abilities. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're just starting and, you know, hopefully we're going to keep doing this work. And that's part of, you know, the fair access is um, trying to actually see and recognize who's in our communities. And I think one of the challenges for a lot of us is going to be how do we reach out to these people that are not library users? Um, and, you know, one of the sessions I attended was talking about partnerships. And it's like, yeah, that's one of the things we're lacking is partnerships with um, people who aren't part of our usual group that we work with. And so um, it's, it's going to be a learning experience, but I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that NAC seems to be on board with this and because we're going to be looking for some support and we're all going to be, we're all going to be in these sessions learning and helping each other through it. So onward. <laughs> onward. Thanks, Suzanne and Kara, <laughs> and NAC members for having this conversation. We're nearing the end of the agenda. I want to um, maybe just ask, it's a difficult time to be thinking about and planning about our services very easy to, to get down about the state of things and just want to know perhaps um, from any or all of you one thing on your horizon in your library that you're excited about or looking forward to. I'll start. <laughs> Um, we are in the midst of trying to get an RFP out for a new master plan for our current building. Oh, I have another one too. But, um, but uh, what I'm excited about is right now it's, it's a really interesting time to look at um, design inside the library. Like how, how does the pandemic affect that? Um, and so I think it's an interesting time to go for this because I think a lot of architects for libraries are thinking about that. Um, so we'll see what we get. Uh, um, I mean, we're thinking about it too. Um, and I was thinking about this yesterday, how, like, what is, how are libraries going to change in this new world? And I feel like it's like, it's like I can almost grasp what that is, but I can't, I can't get it. I can't grab onto it. And so I love having these, all these conversations. It's so great because it helps define future libraries. Um, 
And then the other thing I just thought of is we are starting a satellite branch at the new high, uh, Bozeman High School. It's called Gallatin High School. Um, and so that will be starting in October, depending on if they're open. Um, but we're pretty excited about that, to have something on the west side of Bozeman. Awesome. Yeah. My cat just bought a bird in the house. <laughs> Walking in the living room. I hope my husband's going to take care of it. Whoa. Uh, that's really exciting, Kit. Congratulations. We ordered a new bookmobile and it should be here sometime next March. <laughs> now we just have to raise the rest of the money. Um, and we also are finally, uh, we are going to finally have a, our, like a quote out to fix the flooding in the basement that's been going on for years. So those are my two exciting things. We will just be excited to be able to open the doors again to the public. I can hardly wait to see faces instead of uh, just get emails. Sorry, what's that date, Hanor? When are you opening? We don't have one. Okay. She's redesigning the shelving in their library. Anyone else want to share something you're looking forward to? November? Am I allowed to say that? I would say that I am excited about um, the possibility of sort of reframing what a librarian can do in the schools. I think that we've been trying to do this for a while, but now we're going to be forced into maybe a different role. And it, although it's scary and intimidating and overwhelming, um, maybe a, a different um, appreciation from our teachers and our students for what we have to offer. So I'm hoping we get to, just like Catherine, I'm hoping we get to see faces of our students soon too. And I forgot something. We're, we're going live with the Montana Shared Catalog on September 14th. Oh. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your active participation today. Um, oh, Joyce says there, the administration of the college is looking for funding for a new library building. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you all again. Um, for the purposes of the public meeting, is there any public comment? Right, any other business or announcements? I don't happen to have the date of our November meeting handy, but it's listed there on our, um, the neck website. Thanks, Marlis. Like November 12th? Yes, that's what my calendar says. Great. Right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.
Look forward to visiting with you soon. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.